Uh, we've entitled this Towards the IRP Charter 2.0 because this is hopefully less than a formal boring business meeting than something to talk about a very concrete output which is the Charter of Human Rights and Principles. I brought a hundred copies. I have a hundred more copies back, back in the my luggage only allowed me to bring that many, but they've gone like hotcakes. And uh, there are two copies left, um, but there are more <laughs> on the sheet if you wish to be sent a copy. I'm not sure how I'm going to do it postage-wise, but I do have more. And there will be, I think, a second print run by the look of it. So I do only have two here. Really? Okay. <laughs> can you just leave it standing there for the meantime so people can see? <laughs> There are a couple more plugs I'm going to make as well, but um, in due course. I have some apologies. Eduardo Bertoni cannot make it. Uh, Raika Jorgensen, uh, it is one o'clock in the morning in Denmark, and she has given her apologies, but she will look forward to the update. And Jack SMK um, may not make it. She's not a morning person, and I think she has also another appointment. And Jeremy Malcolm is hopefully on his way. So I'm just mentioning those names because they emailed me, which was really nice of them. <laughs> so actually today I think there's some people in the room who may not be quite aware of where, how we got to this point. I'm not going to tell you everything because in the booklet it's a terrible habit of academics to say go read the book. But in this case I have to because of time. But in a very brief unacademic introduction you'll find out where we came from to get here. Um, and here was already public in 2011. What we have done is actually put this all in one book, which has proved extremely successful. We crowdsourced the booklet, um, and we are nearly there. We have less than 150 American dollars to to um, to catch. I've got some cash in my purse. If you want to give me cash, I'm going to do make a payment on behalf of about six people already. So if you want to give me five dollars, ten dollars, please. Um, which is quite exciting. We raised about eleven hundred, twelve hundred American dollars to fund the design, which is a professional design that is now available to us to use, and of course the printing and all the overheads that are involved. Uh, this book has not only been snapped up, I'm talking about the booklet form at the moment because it's our big output, <laughs> but also translations are also underway. We have a Finnish translation already underway. We have a Spanish translation already underway. We have a Arabic translation um, almost, almost underway because it has just been promised. And we have a, hopefully a Portuguese version and so on and so forth. The point about the translations is this charter booklet puts together two key documents from the coalition. Uh, the coalition is what the IGF calls a dynamic coalition. It is very much an animal, if I may use that term, of the IGF. And this charter was actually collaborating, collaborating. And this is true. I've been following this process since it began in 2008. And it was a, a, a small, modest, but actually turning out to be quite a major success of the idea that people from different stakeholder groups can actually work together as individuals and as, as, as representatives of their organisations. And that process in itself was an interesting story. The outcome was that an expert group finally got together to draft this beautifully written document. Uh, and that's the translations we're working on now because the main document, the main charter, which is modelled on Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other major UN covenants, such as the rights of children, the rights of people with disability, um, we needed people with legal expertise and human rights knowledge to write, help us draft the final document. Those of us in the first drafts showed our ignorance rather than our skills. So <laughs> they knocked it into shape. And we have this lovely 22 or 21 lock, uh, section document. The smaller document, which has been used for outreach, education, I use it in class for different levels of students. I know people have used it for other things. Is what we call the 10 punchy principles. And that's in the beginning of the booklet. The 10 punchy principles are already translated into 22 languages. Already 22 languages. So if there are any languages not covered, we just had the Arabic one spruced up. Apparently there was some funny thing happened to it. Um, please let us know. They're much shorter. They're very short. So they're easier to translate. So this larger translation exercise is very exciting. It has emerged when people see that this is a concrete outcome. We 
we'll talk about the content today, of course. <laughs> so we've also had in two workshops, we co uh, convened two workshops. Workshop 99 was the first one with the uh, Association of Progressive Communications, which everybody knows as APC. APC? <laughs> Not ABC. Um, and that was extremely well. That was called Charting the Charter, and that was concentrating on this document and its relationship to important other uh, rights, charters, manifestos. And then we got some very concrete suggestions from government officials. We got a very critical reading from our Microsoft representative. He discovered two typos. I had only discovered one, so he discovered the other one. And he had some points to make, which I think are worth hearing. So it was an extremely productive workshop. Our second workshop, I believe, was 276. I haven't got that number now. Which was uh, rights for disadvantaged groups. And that was an extremely helpful workshop because section 8, is it? Section 8, I oh, forget. What we have a section devoted to rights for disability groups, building on the Convention of Rights for Persons with Disability, is that right? Um, which is also a major UN outcome. And we've had some clear suggestions on it. So you can see already that the Charter gives people something to hang on to, something to look at, something to respond to. We all like responding to concrete stuff. And that's what this project has been. Strangely enough, the assumption that if it stayed digital, it would be more effective has proved erroneous. Even students like the look of the book. So there we go. Listen to it all. Um, now, the concrete outcomes, which is what we concentrate on today, we've had, of course, a very close relationship with the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, Frank LaRue, from the beginning. Uh, the, this version 1.1 that is now in the booklet was in fact presented to Frank LaRue in Stockholm in 2011. And at that point, as all of us know, he was writing his report, his landmark report that human rights, particularly freedom of expression, also exist in the online sphere. And we also know that in 2012, the UN Human Rights Council endorsed this premise. And this is extremely important for us to have this kind of synergy with such an important body. And frankly, we in person is there. Um, okay. My predecessor, Lisa Horner, and Dixie Wharton were working with Frank Lowe at that time. So we can take pride as a coalition from the IGF that we were there at the beginning with this important UN step to recognize existing rights. Our second um, close working relationship has been with the Council of Europe. And the Council of Europe took a look at the charter work, got very involved, and noted that, of course, there are already many existing rights out there, particularly in the European uh, situation, that nobody knows about. And once this charter started to frame this very broad category of human rights as something specific for the online environment and started to show that we're not, we, we may be hacking the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but we're not throwing it out. We're adapting it and translating it for specific online scenarios, some of which are unfolding before our very eyes. The Council of Europe decided this is the time to flesh out the, uh, the charter, which is very broad, and generate a guide. They called it then a compendium, but that word has been dropped. It is now a guide on rights for internet users, and it is being released tomorrow. So I'd like to advertise, because they're a very, very close relationship with us as well. The guide has been released tomorrow at 11 o'clock, I believe, ma'am. 11 o'clock. I have one version here. Please let me keep that, because that's my hard copy. But I have some flyers here, okay? So this is very exciting, because the expert group that drafted the charter are part of the ex -group, expert group. They've helped draft the guide in the Council of Europe. So UNHCR, Council of Europe. And my exciting announcement today for the transcript and all those I hope you will follow. Last night, the HEBOS Internet Governments Project for the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, said they are going to be actively and publicly endorsing the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet in a region where we know, of course, this is uncharted territory, perhaps, for some governments. So to have them endorse this, to take the charter on, they are behind the Arabic translation. So we're getting on with that. I think this is extremely exciting. So Hanan Bujani, who could not be here today, has made that clear. And that is something I think we can work together on.
So, my last point is we still have our funding rooms are open on the raw <laughs> So if you go to www.internetrightsandprinciples.com and just scroll down and you'll see the charter PDF document um, and click on our fundraiser. We really are so, so close. So, five dollars, it's fine. Or give me cash. I won't run away to a warm climate. I'm already there. <laughs> Dot, 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 excuse me, dot org. Ah! <laughs> Just shows you how hard the default position is to get rid of. Dot org. Thank you very much. No, dot org. So just scroll down a little bit. Okay. So like to the end today, five minutes because I want to give the mic to Stuart if he's ready. <laughs> he has to go. Is this is a sort of open mic session. It's not going to be a panel. Uh, but two points. We've had a lot of feedback on the content the, the really nitty gritty of the charter. We'd like to just in the first part of today have a little round of people who have read the charter or have started to notice it, how they think it can help and particularly how it is already helping in their work, whether it is in this particular ministry, whether it is on the ground with an NGO or whether they're going to take it back to their schools. It's turning out to be an extremely important educational tool. I was lecturing by five minutes. Um, dropping a spot on a lecture to national relations students in Wales, which is in England, not sort of the UK, so not in the UK, ah, in the United Kingdom. Um, so any of those, I'd like to pass that microphone to the room. I have my rapporteur Robert here, and I'm not sure how many notes I can take. So who'd like to go first? We're going to do that first feedback on the chart of the project itself, and then we'll move to next steps, ideas about what to do next. I've already got a long list. People have been coming to me with fabulous ideas. We're going to keep it open. We're not going to judge any of the suggestions and say, no, that won't work. No, we don't like it. We just want to hear what you have to say. And then we move slightly to a little bit of businessy stuff. We might even be finished by 10 o'clock. Let's see how the room is. So who wants to go first, if anybody? Oh, yes, of course, for the record, please identify yourself. Thank you. So I'm Stuart Hamilton from the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, or IFLA, uh, and I'm here in my capacity as uh, one of the conveners of the Dynamic Coalition on Public Access through Libraries, and we were very, uh, very happy yesterday to um, co-facilitate and moderate the workshop 276 on access for disadvantaged groups, which, as Marianne said, went very well, I felt, and I can see panellists uh, in the room. Um, so I don't have very long comments, just that uh, Dynamic Coalition is uh, fully supportive of the Charter. Uh, IFLA itself developed um, a document called the Internet Manifesto in 2002, which has been a, a guiding document for the library profession over the last decade. But as you can imagine, um, a document written about Internet principles in 2002 uh, now seems rather dated. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that we will be updating that during 2014 uh, and the Charter is going to prove a very useful document to help us do that. So I'll be happy to feed back to the group over the course of the next year as to how that's going. And meanwhile, uh, we have already begun to promote the Charter within the library community and I'm sure there will be uh, plenty of discussion on it. So just short remarks uh, to let you know that the Dynamic Coalition on Public Access in Libraries is fully supportive of all the work going on here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. So we look forward to getting particularly the concrete feedback as this charter goes to organisations. It's extremely important. So thank you very much. Stuart now has to leave us, so thanks. <laughs> Who's next? Particularly just ideas, if nothing else. Dixie? Eating your breakfast? <laughs> did you bring your coffee? Oh, you did too. Oh, clear. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dixie Horton. I work for Global Partners Digital in the UK and I've been an active participant in the IRP since I joined this field about four years ago. Um, one of the ways that the IRP charter is being used at the moment is that the Council of Europe, who were very active actually, they were on the steering committee as well of the IRP during the time when the last version and the one before that, I think, were um, being put together. And um, one of the ways that it's being taken forward is that the Council of Europe has put together a working group 
um, to make a guide for that's directed at internet users um, to explain to them in a kind of simple way what their rights mean online and what kind of remedies might be available. Um, and that's something that came very, very much out of the IRP charter work. In fact, on the working group, because it's Council of Europe, there are seven governmental representatives and then there are six independent experts and among those six, three of them were human rights experts that worked on our charter. One of them was a co-chair um, and one of the government, actually two of the government representatives had also been involved in the charter as well. So the, the two initiatives are really, really linked. And that's one of the, um, when we were putting the charter together, one of the big discussions we often had was whether this was something that we wanted to look at enforcement somehow or was it more of a kind of um, a, a kind of debate aid um, trying to push understandings forward and I think the charter as it is there is more of a debate aid but there are ways that you can take that and try and move more towards enforcement and that's what's happening at the Council of Europe at the moment. I'd like to pass on to Ma'am. And just to say that the Council of Europe is having an open forum about that guide tomorrow. So if you want to feed into that, it's still in draft form. I'm Mike Godwin. Uh, I'm with Internews. Uh, we do uh, uh, public policy development with different... One of the things I, I, I want to note at the outset is that uh, in, in my experience in this, uh, in this field of, uh, of international uh, cyber law, one of the ironies is that ha has been that uh, many uh, nations around the world have adopted uh, cybercrime statutes in order to comply uh, as signatories to the Budapest Convention, the Council of Europe Cybercrime Treaty, uh, often uh, imp passing implementing legislation that I think most people in open societies would regard as repressive and undermining uh, uh, human rights. So I think it's uh, very helpful that the Council of Europe is now playing a, a more positive influence. I don't think that this was an intention uh, uh, this was the intention of the Council of Europe to lead to uh, repressive legislation in signatory countries, but the fact is it, 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 has, it has done so. Uh, my own work uh, with Internews and with our partners has led me to believe that uh, positive rights statements, that framing of uh, human rights in positive affirmative contexts as a framework for all cyber uh, law related uh, initiatives uh, is often a very productive strategy even in countries that have either no tradition of internet law uh, public policy advocacy or in countries that for whatever reason have found themselves stalled or paralyzed in their, in their work in progressing uh, individual rights. Uh, and. Uh, so, so I'm actually working on a paper which may eventually be published uh, that will discuss uh, how uh, rights instruments uh, can be used uh, to get, to, to essentially restart human rights dialogues within uh, countries. And I think that what uh, uh, a, an optimum outcome may be will be for uh, 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 charters like this one uh, and for positive framings, affirmative framings of protection of uh, individual uh, human rights, including, of course, freedom of expression and privacy, will lead ultimately to uh, uh, implementing uh, human rights instruments within uh, national law frameworks, which may, in fact, be uh, customized or uh, bespoke for particular countries and cultures, but nevertheless, will uh, frame uh, uh, dialogue positively, uh, policy positively going forward. Uh, so I hope that that is uh, one of the aims of this and I, and I look forward to uh, seeing how the, this document uh, can be used uh, to promote constructive dialogue within nations as, the, 
as our partners and other NGOs are working on a national level. Yeah, thank you very much. I think the stress on the positive framework and hopefully having good law made, not bad law, because that's of course. So Maureen next and then following. First Maureen because she's in the queue. Yeah, uh, thank you. I'm Maya Mazuki. I'm an academic based in Paris, but also I have an activist hat uh, as a member of the European Digital Rights uh, Association. Um, I wanted to um, to give more details about the the process uh, uh, in writing the guide. But first, I will uh, take on uh, what uh, Mike just said uh, because. Um, uh, we know the we know this issue of the cybercrime convention and how uh, the Council of Europe, another um, division, I would say, of the Council of Europe, because these intergovernmental organizations have uh, their own lives too. Uh, so another division has been promoting, and that's through the cybercrime convention, the Budapest Convention, and I would like to mention it to insist that all these workshops in Asia, in South America, in Africa have been uh, organized thanks to a huge amount of money given by Microsoft, uh, uh, especially my Microsoft, to organize this uh, workshop. So we have this, but we shouldn't forget another positive instrument of the, positive from our point of view, instrument of the Council of Europe, which is also a convention like the Cybercrime Convention, and this is the Convention on the uh, Protection of Personal Data, or Convention 108 of the Council of Europe. And we very much hope that the Council of Europe will decide to promote the 108 Convention as much as it uh, promotes the Cybercrime uh, Convention. And uh, good morning, Lee the Council of Europe representative, the positive side, I would say, of the Council of Europe. Um, on the process uh, to uh, draft uh, this guide, first of all, I, I would like to mention that the guide is, uh, the guide itself is an annex of a recommendation to member states. And although a recommendation of the Council of Europe is a soft law instrument, it is non-binding, this is a very important, it's le the level right under the convention, the treaty. And uh, it is important to the extent that the European Court of Human Rights is now quoting uh, referencing recommendations of the Council of Europe in its uh, judgment. So uh, what was important in this process is first of all that uh, civil society uh, member and representatives of the IRP coalitions uh, including myself were uh, part of this process not simply as observer but as true members of the group at the same level as some governments. Uh, represented there. And then uh, maybe we will get back to this a uh, bit later in the discussion uh, on the content of the, uh, the guide itself with respect to the content of the charter. We have had some discussions and some decisions to make together in this group, especially on uh, what is called in the charter uh, the right to access the internet. Uh, I think it's interesting if we have time later in this meeting to discuss whether or not uh, we have uh, approved this uh, notion of a new right to, uh, to, to access and, and for which uh, reasons. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maureen. We'll return to those, those uh, uh, substantive points hopefully shortly. And we have yeah. one and then someone's hand up there. Okay, so first of all. Yeah. So I want to ask a clarification question. My name is uh, Shahla Rashid. I work on internet policy in India. Um, so at one place, uh, the report, I, I was just skimming through it, it says that uh, uh, since this charter is based on human rights principles, so it will be binding upon states. So I want to clarify whether th this will be binding in the same way as ICCPR is binding, for example. Uh, remains to be seen. What that's not intended at the moment. This is we are on a long, long road. This charter is a framing document. Well, some people have there are great ambitions, but uh, the title of this workshop is Towards Charter 2.0. But it, it speaks in that language. 
as far as we're concerned right now. But there are many points on which uh, to be binding, a lot of more discussion has to take place. It but it's within that tradition. Adopted by the state. Adoption. Um, that's something about next steps. Mm -hmm. what, what, what are your views on that? Whether it should be adopted a charter like this? Um, no, at some at uh, at another point it says that it does not include all rights, but that doesn't mean that those rights don't exist. Um, so obviously, there, I imagine that there will be more discussion. Uh, it's very carefully worded that this is. Um, I'm not a lawyer here, so perhaps the expert group can help me out there. <laughs> um, it's very carefully worded uh, during the drafting. I certainly remember would be very careful that you didn't write in such a way that the spirit of the document could be turned to purposes of repression. So it's not trying to say some rights and not other rights. It's written within that uh, UN legal framework. So I don't quite know what you're referring to exactly. Perhaps you could a little bit on that. Um, I Good morning. Um, my name is Beryl Aid. I'm from the Kenya Human Rights Commission. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much uh, for uh, this information. I, I find it um, quite useful um, as we're going to be having some uh, workshops with uh, the wider NGO um, or human rights or civil society in the, uh, who are members of the mainstream civil society but are n not involved in internet governance um, uh, discourse or internet rights discourse. So I, I think it's quite uh, straightforward and quite clear and easy to understand. I also want to appreciate um, uh, the, the, uh, the the articles themselves, um, I think number 20, duties and responsibilities on the internet, this is something that has been taken for granted, at least where I come from, uh, people think that they can just say anything on the internet because of the free, uh, freedom of expression uh, and, and um, without really realizing that um, there are duties and responsibilities and so I, I appreciate the fact that uh, it recognizes that and uh, divides that in, into two, um, respect for others and then also responsibility for the power holders which I think uh, sort of like safeguards against um, uh, it being used or, or other um, other laws that have uh, that could be enacted that could be repressive or could um, um, violate human rights thank you thank you very much uh, Bill. I think that kind of responds to the point all right very well thank you anybody else oh sorry of course anybody else I had you in the queue excuse me Good morning, everybody. My name is Jan Norman, and I work with the APC Women's Rights Program. Um, and the first thing really is to appreciate the, the growth and movement, I think, of the Internet rights with the principles and charter. I think what we really want to contribute to this discussion is a recognition of the fact that equal application and understanding doesn't always result in equal experiences and consequences, um, including, and in fact, especially in the context of human rights. Um, so we're really looking at the gender dimensions and beginning to understand how the recommendations will affect different groups of people unequally. And I think that's the basis for a really interesting discussion that can move us into a, into a space where we are considering that people are not homogenous, that responses are not homogenous, and so the kinds of recommendations we are calling for need to consider this. One of the things we especially are concerned about is how recommendations could result for one group of people, but not for others. Um, in the work that we're doing, we often find when we're talking about violence online, sexuality, the response by government is to say, oh, so you need protection. And in the language of protection, what we also know is that it closes down spaces. It doesn't open them up. And so that's what we want to contribute. I put Julie Taken, thank you very much, thank you very much. Of course, this links to the Gender IT Workshop where a number of the issues around the Charter's clauses with respect to women's participation uh, was also brought up, so I've made a mental note of those things as well. Um, just final comments on this particular part of the session. We're going to move to next steps. Um, anybody else have any specific concrete? Uh, oh, yes, sorry, yes, go ahead. And Robert.
Okay. Hello. Yeah. So I'm Mika. I'm from the Foundation for Media Alternatives in the Philippines, and also um, a student community member of the Philippine Internet Freedom Alliance. Um, we have we have this cyber crime law that was passed that was passed um, in the law last year, and when we were talking about the 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 um, our our petition against the law, we use actually the Internet Rights and Principles um, document. So that we can forward our our um, our arguments against the law. So I um, really appreciate what is happening here. And um, right now we're trying to uh, actually, um, as you all know, we have this Magna Carta for Philippine Internet Freedom, um, and they also used um, the IRP document um, as reference when they were drafting the 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 bill. And we were really optimistic that the legislators in the Philippines will really look into this document as well so that we can have um, a good legislation on governing our internet. So there, so um, yeah. Thank you very much. I'll come. Uh, yeah, and one other, other thing, because I was in the, in the discussion yesterday, the main session discussion on cybercrime, and I was really disappointed that they they're not really talking about um, you know rights there. Um, it's just about um, technical uh, problems uh, online and no recognition of of the things that we're doing here in internet rights and principles coalition. So I think um, it, it's also good that you know um, uh, intervene in that. Types of discussion. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yes, given cyber, cyber security and cyber crime are the hot topics. Your points were well taken. Being more proactive and intervening in discussions where rights are not considered relevant or not technical enough. That's part of the work to bring these very high-level ideas and principles and rights into the sort of really everyday nitty-gritty of how the internet's worked. Um, design, but also how people use it. So this is uh, the broad terrain which we're working. Well, someone else's hand is up. Who was it? Oh, Robert, of course. I'm sorry. Hi, thank you. Uh, Robert Bowen, uh, a member of the Internet Rights and Principles Dynamic Coalition and a college professor uh, in Ohio. Um, I find the use of this document uh, of the charter very helpful in uh, a class that I teach, Human Rights in the Digital Age, and I use um, texts such as Human Rights in the Global Information Society by Ricky Jorgensen. Uh, but this, this document actually is, uh, allows um, me to shape lesson plans that um, can encourage a collection of case studies uh, around identifying particular rights that are violated and how particular principles can address those rights. It's very helpful as um, an educational resource. Thank you. Okay. One more comment if there is one before we move to next steps. If any we're sort of moving in that direction. Okay. Anybody else is it somebody online? Oh no, it's too early in the morning for some too late at night for others. Understood. Too early in the morning for me. Um Right, let's move to next steps. Now we've had a lot of discussions, we're getting a lot of questions about what our next steps are. <laughs> um, we are a dynamic coalition, we are excited to see initiatives like the Council of Europe's Guide where it anchors the Charter in real life um, um, legislative practice. Uh, we have a complimentary document, so we're excited that we can go there tomorrow at the launch. It's exciting to hear about it's been, how it's been used in class. I think these, to me, these strike me as next steps that we've already started. But um, this is a coalition that is within the IGF. We've made it clear already today in the last few days that the Charter has gone beyond the IGF. We're not locked into the IGF. The IGF is simply a place people come. And sometimes impact is not immediately evident. But nevertheless, we need a discussion about next steps. In terms of, and here let's not worry about whether it's possible or not right now. You know, the first thing you do when you think about next steps, think, oh, I haven't got the money, I haven't got the time, I haven't got the, I haven't got the people, I haven't got the bravado, I haven't got the skills, 
or we haven't got the skills. Can we just brainstorm? I will write this all up with Robert's help so we can sort of issue a bullet point to the larger list. Um, how is the list, that piece of paper going around with names, people writing their names? How where is it? Okay, keep it going. Okay, any suggestions, ideas? Please, the sky at the moment is the limit in this room. We're not going to say, yes, we're going to do this all. We're not going to say, we're not going to shoot you down in flames with no, we cannot, and do the Obama thing. Well, yes, we can. <laughs> if. <laughs> okay, please. Hi. Um I'm Catherine Easton, I'm um, a legal academic in the UK, and I mean, first I'd like to congratulate you on this document. Um, it's, it's fundamental to how the internet develops, keeping, as was mentioned, a positive focus on rights. Um, what I would like to talk about, as far as future steps are concerned, um, are some potentially legalistic moves that you, that you could take, and I apologise for coming from quite a strong legal background here. But it's been mentioned that this has been adopted as far in terms of a recommendation at, at an EU level. And again, I apologise for talking about this at a specific EU level. But what I was wondering was whether or not there's um, a case for working with member state governments in order to see this charter attached as either an amendment or a schedule to relevant domestic legislation. And in this way, it can become more pervasive and have an, an impact more at, at a kind of at a, a more local level. And unless there are some regulations coming from the EU, there's no need for the actual member states to, to to move on this. And I've seen this in relation to standards on accessibility, where they have been mentioned as schedules to domestic legislation in the UK, and this has given them much more of a kind of robust, tangible um, impact um, on development of policy and development of law. So I was just wondering whether perhaps with the Council of Europe there is a need to talk about this at a higher level and get the member states to embed this, perhaps not as direct primary legislation, but as a document that is referenced at the end of legislative uh, provisions for the made. Okay, thanks Catherine for noting that. It's uh, very down to earth. This is what we're looking for. Thank you. No apologies needed to go the legalistic route. Any other suggestions? Yes, Carmen? Oh. Yeah. Uh, okay. We're taking ideas at the moment. We can comment on whether they're useful or, or possible later. So, Carmen, yeah? Hey, uh, I'm Carmen Turk, and I actually have a, um, uh, it's really a suggestion, it's kind of like um, uh, sharing an experience in, in Estonia. Uh, during the ACTA protests, um, well, they were all over Europe, so I'm sure everybody knows what I'm talking about. Uh, in Estonia, they were extremely uh, big in the meaning that it, it was the uh, biggest protest in uh, Estonian history since 91 when the independence was regained. Uh, so during and after ACTA, uh, the government, uh, the, well, the civil society tried to kind of uh, draft something for the government in order for it to, in the future, when enacting laws in the field of internet would not go viral again as it did when enacting ACTA or trying to enact an ACTA. Uh, so uh, in that process, actually, civil society tried to uh, do their own Estonian kind of principles for internet regulation and uh, the IOP principles, rights and principles were referenced by me as a basis for it. So it, it was already a basis for um, uh, draft law. So it, it's just an experience of how to use it in the legislative process. Thanks, Karen. It's very useful to me. These examples are very useful. Now I think my name is next and somebody else. And then the uh, over here, oh, we have it. Yeah, uh, just wanted to to clarify that uh, it, uh, we are talking about the Council of Europe, not the Council of the European Union. So it's uh, 
even better, I mean, it's a larger 47 uh, steps. And uh, uh, about this issue of using this uh, charter uh, either to to have uh, better national legislation or as a real tool for civil society at, na at national level, uh, I think what we could do, what is possible to do with this charter is taking, I mean, right by right as it is uh, 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 defined, and we can use it first to uh, uh, develop some indicators on the uh, level of uh, of um, uh, on, on whether national legislation are compliant with human rights or, or not, and uh, also we could use this article. For instance, I'm thinking of uh, the number four uh, right to development through the the internet, which probably still needs a lot of work. Uh, uh, yet we can use it uh, to um, assess telecom regulation uh, because it has to do with telecom regulation at national and at international uh, uh, level. It has to do with network neutrality. So we can use this uh, charter and each article o o of it to uh, assess uh, this legislation and, of course, help uh, developing better national uh, legislation. Yes, exactly. 21 or 22, I forget, clauses are each in themselves the beginning of the tip of various icebergs. So they, of course, apart from addressing some of the uh, need perhaps for the writing, that's another step, to at least use what we have currently as a focus as a hub, is that what you mean, like focus on particular sections? I think that's a very good idea too. They're all good ideas so far. Anybody else with Lee, Papa Lee? You go for it. Thank you, Harry. Uh, Lee Hibbard from the Council of Europe. Um, I think a very good step would be to, and I'm thinking about the, char the, the charter, but also about the guide that you mentioned. Um, I think it's really important to uh, try to measure what comes next. It's very difficult. It's okay drafting and, and, and doing things and talking and, and having documents, but the, the, the very difficult thing in, in many fields is to try to measure uh, the impact in different countries across the world. Was it used? Was it referred to in Estonia? Because referrals to different documents get lost in the process of, you know, a, a lot of documents I come across and people appropriate them and then don't refer back to them. So that makes it very difficult to understand whether it was a real source of relevance or a reference, and it was useful. So if the, if the coalition can, can come together and say, in Estonia, you know, it was used, in this country it was useful, in this country it was done like this, that will help to catalogue and to sh actually demonstrate how, you know, useful these documents are. Not because it's a document, but because it changes the law, or because it creates a movement, or it cl clarifies a right, which is unclear, and even if it just means that there was a discussion which clarified something in a right in a country far away, uh, that's very useful, that's very important. I mean, that, uh, it's very difficult to explain to policymakers um, the utility of something if you don't have sometimes proof that this is happening. But they don't always refer back. So that's a very, uh, in next steps, even to do with the work of the Council of Europe, I think it's very useful. Um, Marianne, can I talk about the guide or have you mentioned it? I came in late. We mentioned it on several occasions, but uh, just to do you want to I've talked about the, uh, the launch tomorrow at 11, and perhaps you could tell us what you're looking for from uh, us who can go. I think you said it all. You said that it, it, these two processes are, are complementary. Um, I think you really need you really need to be there if you can really tomorrow because it's not about uh, it's not just an event with the word Europe in the title because it's the Council of Europe. For unfortunately, there's too few words. I, I want to forget the word Europe because I really, I sincerely think that this is not about anything particular, country or region. It's about people. It's about people's rights, and whether those rights are a little bit different over there or, or slightly modified over there, it doesn't matter. Um, the IGF has been about bringing people together and discussing and um, coming together on things which they believe in. They believe in the internet. They believe in the openness of the internet. They believe in a free internet, uh, and of course we believe in people's rights on the internet. And that's been a major uh, priority for the whole, since the IGF began, 
and in the World Summit process before, about people having the ability to have rights and freedoms. And they sometimes get, let's say, lost in the politics of internet, the control and the governance of internet, which goes very far away from people. And um, But it's a constant feature, a massive feature on the agendas. It's always, uh, most of the events, let's say, three quarters always have a human rights dimension to them. So that is the, that for me that's the crux of it. And I, I really hope that um, you can all be there because um, if we can get this guide for you off the ground, if you can comment and input, and if, you, if we can measure it, um, we can really push back in terms of internet governance. And if we can create a reference point, you know, regional or global, you know, whichever title, it's going to be very useful to try to get... If, if there's a, now there's a discussion about internet governance principles. Oh, I have to hurry. Uh, if, for example, in the ne ne next months we can have internet governance principles which are generally agreed across the world, it's a great, it's a great source of reference. If we can do the same thing with rights, or what they mean in practice, that's a fantastic step. So, you know, that's where I think we should go, you know, having, you know, creating clarity on these rights in practice. And that's where the guide goes. So I hope we can contribute tomorrow. Okay, thanks. I think that's a very important invitation to us all. Um, anybody else in terms of next steps? Uh, as the uh, Charter of Human Rights and Principles, just to recall, this is a delicate uh, distinction, but an, an important overlap. Um, not all principles are human rights. But one can argue that human rights are always a principle. But how and in what form is the question. So there are actually um, discussions at the moment about exactly coming down to some uh, large global agreement which brings us up to recognition and uh, applicability. But we're at the moment just carrying on with uh, what are the next steps in terms of the charter. More promotion, more outreach measuring, joining the dots, really not just a settling for it got reference in a book list somewhere. I think these points are very important. References for academics are important, but for policy makers, mm, mm, we shouldn't know the rating ourselves. Okay? So it's not just about being in a reference list. However, if you're not in a reference list, you're nowhere. So I think this point is we have to do more than just say we got reference. Any other comments about what to do next? Someone? No? Um, there's a piece of paper still going around for those of you who just came into the room if you wish to make your name an email address or just sort of know where you're from and, and who you are. But okay, go. Okay, I, um, I don't know a lot about the process and how it all came. This is also my first time at the IGF. Um, but I was wondering how much is the UN, oh my God. How much is the UN uh, involved in the process? Not that I have any special uh, preference for the UN. But uh, in my understanding, that's how all the instruments that, you know, that get recognized or that are binding one states or are recognized. Uh, the UN is involved in the sense that, as uh, I said in the beginning, how Frank Lowe, the special rapporteur, uh, was uh, uh, very instrumental in moving the charter forward in its first version. This version was uh, presented to him when the charter version 1.1, which is what this booklet is, was released. And it's through that synergy that we had Frank Lowe's report on freedom of expression online. And there's a direct link between that report, of course, and the UN Human Rights Council's recognition that human rights online exist. So there is definitely a, uh, a connection. But I think those sorts of questions we can happily answer. Um, but thank you. Yes, I think it's something we need to, it's a good point though. The UN is, it is embedded in the UN. Our legal instruments, but it also relates to very important moves at the UN level to recognise human rights online. But recognition is the first step. Lots to go. Yeah. Um, anybody else? I think we need to move on. Okay, yes, Shona. Some at the back. Just bear with us. I think we can, uh, because I'd like to move to just the sort of practical business shortly, but I want to make sure everyone's had a chance. Of course, we're open to suggestions at any point. The IGF is not over yet. If you have a brilliant idea, please um, let us know. Go for it. Thank you. Um, so this is sort of building on um, the previous question relating to um, building on human rights mechanisms. So I'm wondering, um, Marianne or anyone else in the room, how you see uh, the Internet Rights and Principles Charter um, input into discussions, for example, on hate speech or racism in the internet and discussions about responses to that. So 
Um, so some of the discussions that have been had so far are the need for more access to the internet by marginalized groups, which I know is part of um, the principles. But are there other ways you see the charter sort of inputting to those sorts of discussions? Dixie, ma'am? I think there's a lot of work being done in the Internet Democracy Project, Dixie herself, and I know you, you wrote a specific paper on hate speech. Am I right? Was it hate speech or state surveillance? I'm oh, sorry. Um, yes, I think that's the work that needs to be done. I think the charter needs to be, for me, brought into those intervened as a part of the intervention of conversations. But I think if you read the charter closely, there are plenty of places where you can see that um, civil society activists trying to stop the idea that freedom of expression means you can be rude to everybody everywhere at any time. Um, but this, of course, is the difference between the First Amendment and the U.S., where you can be rude to anybody at any time, uh, up to a point, so Americans can correct them on that. But that's the usual kind of decision you get. And the rest of the, uh, the European setting, you know, perhaps they have to be regulated. But yes, I think the charter can be used. So how do you think the charter can be used in that sense, specifically in your, in your point? Um, well, I think it's interesting. I think there are, I mean, as you say, there's rights that are incorporated into the Charter, and so there are, of course, freedom of expression, but there are also um, other freedoms related to, um, you know, freedom from discrimination, um, the right to life, liberty, and security. And so um, I'm just sort of wondering whether or not you see there's a space for expansion or whether you see um, any of the rights and principles within the Charter um, being developed in some way to specifically respond to these sorts of quite complex discussions? I would take that as a very helpful suggestion that indeed that's what we can do. I think Mary mentioned that each section be unpacked and made applicable to different situations, case studies. So you have the section as it is and then you flesh it out. Not try and do everything all at once. Yeah? So I think that each section can be a sort of template in itself and feedback and then do a sort of loop. But absolutely, I think it's a very good suggestion. I, I certainly support it personally. I hope we can as a coalition. Uh, and we have someone else here? Oh, I, I was just going to say in, in defense of our First Amendment in the United <laughs> States. <laughs> no, I was just thinking about... Uh, about please, I think so. Just stop. Please, 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 please. Uh, my name is Susan Anthony. I work for the federal government in Alexandria, Virginia, in the United States. Um, I was just thinking about something uh, as we're talking about this that, that bothers me deeply, and I was trying to figure out exactly where this would fit in. I think uh, it, it probably would be a prohibited conduct, uh, certainly under, a decla under these declarations and uh, possibly under uh, <coughs> right of free speech in the United States. It was certainly rude. So what am I talking about? Uh, for those of you who uh, follow such issues, uh, you may well know that the Redskins sports team name, um, uh, the Redskins being the football team for Washington, D.C., is very much in the news. It has been off and on for some years, but it is incredibly hot, hot, hot right now. So uh, it's very interesting. Every time the Washington Post uh, has an article um, online, uh, makes, it art makes one of its articles accessible online, there is, of course, an opportunity to comment. And there has been a great uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth with many people saying that the Redskins' name does not offend them. Of course, they're, they're not native. But at any rate, one person wrote something that so offended me and continues to bother me. He said, I have no objection, and I am from a tribe. And I thought, now that is something we need to know. He said, I am from the tribe Slapaho. And I thought, well, I, I think we need to get that taken down. And I, I think that this would, in fact, uh, violate the, the freedom of expression because it is uh, an expression that offends and is disturbing. But we have a long ways to go in terms of educating people as to these lines between free expression and just damn rude and offensive. Yes, this is always a very delicate issue for, I think, for regulators at a very local level, particularly as online circulation um, expands and all these issues, yes, take down policies. Uh, can we, uh, was it Mike? Am I correct? Yeah, thank you very much. 
a case study perhaps for future reference. Yeah. Is the mic on? Okay, yeah. very good. So, uh, speaking as a First Amendment lawyer, um, what I what I try to take a historical view of uh, of rights instruments, not just the First Amendment, but I look, I, I, and certainly in my current work, I look very hard at. Uh, human rights instruments in different countries around the world and in the international human rights instruments. And uh, I, I, think it, I think it helps to take a historical view because prior to what happened, uh, not just in the United States with freedom of expression under the First Amendment, but with freedom of expression issues in many uh, developed countries in the 20th century, and it almost all happened in the 20th century, uh, we, we came to realize, those of us who work in this space, that prior to that period of very, very rapid development, for almost all of human history, every government everywhere reserved to itself the right to shut people up. And uh, it, it was just understood that governments have the right to do that. And uh, for all that one may find, uh, you know, the particular environment of uh, freedom of speech in the United States uh, offensive from time to time, or actually on the internet generally where people often don't feel particularly localized to a jurisdiction, uh, I think it's no surprise to, uh, to anyone here that people occasionally feel the impulse to say rude things to one another on the internet. Um, I think that uh, articulating the freedom of expression principles in a strong way at the outset of these debates in the 20th century has led to uh, very uh, progressive interpretations of the international human rights instruments and of particular national uh, human rights instruments as well uh, that really do embody a great degree of uh, tolerance for uh, at least to some degree, for offensive and troubling speech. And if you think about why governments uh, have historically reserved to themselves the right to censor speech, it's one more sentence, yeah, go uh, it's because uh, they want to censor disturbing and troubling speech because nobody ever tries to censor the other kind. So I just wanted to put that out there, and I think that actually the human rights instruments that we're working on here and the international uh, freedom of expression uh, guarantees are, uh, and the First Amendment are all part of a, of a very modern and progressive tradition that I think uh, um, uh, I, I'm proud to be a part of and I hope we continue to advance here. Okay, that brings, I think, we'll get um, last speak. Of course, the issue about hate speech and the difference between is rudeness a crime? Uh, do we prosecute somebody for being rude? But there's a slide into hate speech, uh, which also is an issue that perhaps as a case study, Uncle Alan Roberts' ideas is something that needs investigating according to specific sections of the Charter to help it highlight just these debates, which would be in themselves for me interesting as an academic, and will make them relevant for policymakers eventually. So these discussions need to happen. Um, thank you, Mike. That was really important, and the point is well taken. So, last comment, because we're at quarter, 10 past 10, and I need my coffee, and we have about five, ten minutes of things to sort out. Okay? Thanks. Um, just to pick up on the point that I think you're making, I think that there is rude, there's rude comments, there's offensive comments, and, there, and then there's threats. There are threats to violence. Someone saying, I hate you, who do you think you are, is not the same thing as saying, I know where you live and I'm coming to kill you. Or, in the instance of our work, I know where you live, I want you to be quiet and I'm coming to rape you. That's a very different conversation. And I think often what happens is, when we raise these issues, the anxiety is that we're calling for censorship. Is it censorship when you say to someone, actually, that's not okay? Yeah, I think it's about the framing of the conversation that sometimes causes a kind of, um, yeah, it causes an anxiety that what we're saying is regulate, what we're saying is criminalize, when that's not necessarily, I think, a productive entry point, but rather what's necessary is to flesh out how, why is this happening and are there different kinds of responses which are not about censorship because I don't think the entry point is to censor. Okay, final, so just final, if we complete that, I think, yes, a more constructive way is to approach this, just, did you have a, okay. We need, the, we need the microphone because there are people transcribing, so if you just wait a moment.
Remember, there's a whole world out there that's going to wake up tomorrow morning and going to rush to their computers to read this transcript. <laughs> so have set their alarm clocks to do so. <laughs> so final point on this topic. I'm sorry to have to be brutal, but yes, go. No, I was just saying that the hate speech paper was written by Anya and it's not public yet. And that, that determines all this in detail. Okay. When will it be public? Mm, I don't, you can ask okay. her. Okay, thank you very much. That's very, very useful, everyone. I'm just going to move to some um, quick points, and obviously because they have to be continued on our list. If you want to sign up to the coalition list, it is, um, Tapani, what's it again? IRP at internetrightsandprinciples.org, and you can sign up. Um, please don't put any emails from me in your spam box. It's not the intention. Um, these lists have a habit of coming in waves. Um, so, I'm going to move quickly from me to some business uh, and we'll complete the business online. Just let me move my computer. For those who are new to the IRP coalition, we are as a, a dynamic coalition, very much a do-it-yourself. And I mean do-it-yourself in the strong, positive sense of the term, not do-it-yourself as the sad, we have no money sense of the term. Um, uh, just to recall those who have not yet heard yet, we managed to raise nearly 11, 1200 American dollars to finance the booklet and so we're looking for the last few dollars. If you have American dollars on you, press it into my hot sweaty palm please. I have 60 American dollars with me in various currencies. I will then make one credit card payment on my own credit card on behalf of you all. Um, because some people don't want to use a credit card. Five dollars, one dollar, oh, I don't know, I'm happy with anything. And then we'll be there. Um, we're also very active in, yes? Take money from Bali? I'll take rupiah because I'll spend that. Right. Okay. <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll, I'll spend rupiah. <laughs> <laughs> remember, remember, no, 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 not too much, it's Thursday, Thursday I have lots of boutique to buy, but I will use my, my credit card to pay on your behalf, so thank you, um, so come up afterwards. So very quickly, um, the IRP coalition also works with other dynamic coalitions, as Stuart Hamilton reminded us, and so we work profitably together. We're also an active member of the Best Bits, which is a new, uh, really important network and space um, emerging from the IGF with with um, a large set of plans that we hope to contribute to. So we're not like a little island here. And of course we have some important um, civil society organisations as well and governmental um, membership from APC, IT for Change, Council of Europe has been involved and so on and so forth. So I just want to stress that. Um, we also have steering committee members also voluntarily and I'm, I'm going to say goodbye and thank you to some people who are very important to note for the record. I'd like to say thank you and goodbye and good luck to Matthias Ketterman who was my co-chair, who was Dixie Wilton's co-chair and who in previous um, uh, role as chair, co-chair. <laughs> <laughs> so Matthias Kedeman is standing down, which means he enters the steering committee. Matthias is a, um, a legal expert based in Frankfurt. So my apologies publicly to Matthias for attributing, attributing him incorrectly as German. He is in fact Austrian, and I have corrected that, and people don't understand why I must do this publicly. Um, I've attributed it correctly on the new digital PDF, so this print version. So please correct now your print version. Um, these things happen. Um, most of us, people think I'm British, I'm not. Okay. Um, with all due respect to the British. Okay, Lee. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> okay, now, that's, our, that's my former co chair, which means the post is open. Steering committee members, I'd like to say goodbye and thank you very much to the following people who have, um, who have been helpful, very helpful this year and in previous years actually. Some of these steering committees have been around a while and have been very instrumental in early versions. I'd like to thank Yanko Eisenman. I can get the names down um, for the record. Alan Barr, Norbert Bello, Mike Gerstein, Shola Mystery. I'd like to thank them very much, Shola particularly who was there in the early days. But this stuff requires you to answer emails <laughs> and do lots of things that sometimes are not possible and they have done great service. Thank you very much. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you. Oh, there's my accent written up there for you all to see. Oh my goodness me. Okay. I would now like just to note that our, our current steering committee stands at six members. 
uh, Tapuni Tavulan, Tapuni, please make yourself, who also runs our IRP list serve from um, Electronic Foundation Finland. Thank you, Tapuni, who's carrying on pumping the thing who I know is also going to give his apologies. IT for Change in India, Vic Zabados. I'm in Hungary, He's, he was extremely helpful for us. He's new and young. <laughs> young people, please step forward. <laughs> uh, Dixie Walton, I believe, is still okay. Please tell me if I'm wrong, people. There's no obligation because I'm meaning you. Matthias Ketanon, who's indicated, of course, he's as former coach here. He's in the And of course, Robert Bowden, who you've all met. So that's the current steering committee membership of six people plus me. Now the question is, is six people are sufficient? Do we need more? Um, if we need more, then we did, we, I propose we do what we did last year, self-nominate and go through an election endorsement process on one. But the question is in this room, do we need more than six people on the same committee? Is that enough? I mean, I'm not saying this decision should be made here definitively, but Dixie, do you have any inputs? I think just for a couple of minutes, I think it's important to consider this, because steering committees um, are just simply there to help knock ideas around with, <coughs> provide suggestions, put up with emails from the chair, uh, with chairs for Dixie and then Olivier, yeah? I don't think we necessarily need more people, because six is quite a good number, but I think we probably do want new people, because if everyone that's on the steering committee has been a, on the steering committee last year as well, then, you know, we can stagnate. It'd be good to have new ideas and new people on there. Thanks, Dixie. It's my fault entirely. Especially, listen, I just want to say, just before Olivia comes in, we had a very successful outing at the Lisbon European Dialogue of Internet Governance. We had a fabulous time, and that's building forward. Belgrade, I'm sort of going to be there for Council of Europe. Um, Thing. So the IP Coalition, um, through Victor particularly, is based in Hungary. Victor did fabulous work, um, really engaging with younger people and got a whole lot of new members. So I, I endorse Dixie's point. We don't, we could hang out with six, but I think we can be open um, to new members. Partic would I be able to say that younger members? I don't want to be ageist, but we are getting a bit middle-aged with all due respect. Maybe it's just me. Um, if anybody wants to join the Senior Ladies Caucus, it was formally convened last night at the pool, by the way. You may join us. No, no previous experience required. Okay, but Dixie, so Olivier. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Olivier Kapan of uh, speaking. Um, I think the committee might wish to consider having some strategic uh, positions in the committee, so perhaps uh, uh, thinking of people that you might wish to invite from outside this room. Uh, from elsewhere that might be helpful for the committee. And then, of course, it, it really is down to, to you guys to find out how the workload is. And if you need a heck of a lot more people for all the work that happens, then by, no, you know, by all means, go it. Um, if, on the other hand, uh, you're having a great time, then uh, uh, and there's not very much work or anything like that, and I suspect that's not the case, um, no. then you might <laughs> want to shrink work. the committee and just end up with one. Okay. No, I'm just kidding with this one. Um, no, you're doing an excellent job, so thank you. Yeah. No, I think the point is taken. The steering committee is not a closed shop. I think let's open it up. We agreed. We open it up to the to the list. Okay. And if anybody wants to that wants to self nominate now for the steering committee, let us know. And this can be put to the list afterwards. Is there any other business? It's not any other business. It's just the uh, um, the point before, which is to say that. Uh, Everyone, uh, as regards being on the steering committee, it's, it's always difficult to see what, to decide whether you have the time to do that extra work because you have lots of work. Um, that goes for me too. But I am committed to helping, oh, not okay. being on the steering committee. Yes, exactly. So I cannot. Yeah. So what I what I'm saying is that if I could be loosely associated to the, to the committee, if you could strategically just grab me for something, one thing. Occasionally, okay. where it's need, I, I can help, that, and, and that's being loosely associated. I think that's something which needs to be understood. I mean, I think there are plenty of people who can do that rather than be nominated, you know, appointed, and have their name ah. everywhere. So. I think it's a very good idea. Thank you, Lee. So we could we open it if anybody wants to self nominate the steering committee, which means committing to a certain amount of work and co-thinking, and a loose group of people who yeah. can we can call on in off-list emails to help out. But do, also self nominate and do, keep it kind of light. Define a title, loosely associated. Loose, loose association. Friends of the, friends of the steering committee. Um, 
there's a lovely phrase in, in the Netherlands where I work and live, have worked for many years and still live part time. Um, yeah, whatever. They say critical friends, critical friends. So critical friends of <laughs> or friendly critics. <laughs> okay, um, but loosely. So I think that's a great idea. Let's put that forward. Um, we still have a list of people. I think there's a second page walking around the room. Is there any other business? I have one other item I'd like to also, because we have two copies left of the charter. I have more in my office, but two for now. Stampede about to begin. Uh, the guide um, poster for tomorrow's Council View at launch, and some flyers of a very important book, um, Framing the Net, from Mike Jorgensen, who is a member of the expert group of the charter and the expert group of the Council of Europe guide. And she's written, I would suggest, the definitive book on how human rights has been framed in a number of areas. So I'd like to plug this book on America's behalf. I think it's a, a very important reference point. So um, without too much further ado, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming at this hour and lovely to have you. And see you around on the list or in person. Money to me. Money to me. And the final list of names and addresses to me as well. We'll try and transcribe all these. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. I'm here as part of the YIGF project with Childnet International. Um, this is the discussion that we're going to be having today uh, surrounding online anonymity, freedom of expression, and internet governance. So last year in Baku, uh, the team discussed, uh, conducted a workshop entitled Social Media, Young People, and Freedom of Expression. And some of the conclusions which arose from the discussion were that anonymity gives power, that it can offend, but that it also gives people a voice, and that it can aid freedom of expression. Uh, but at the same time, it can provide a mask which encourages people to behave differently uh, for, for the worse or for the better. Uh, so that was the foundation from which we uh, built this year's discussion. And we think it's particularly relevant to the IGF sub-theme, human rights, freedom of expression, and information. Um, so in preparation for the IGF at summer camp this year, we defined anonymity as interacting online without revealing who you are. So this is our working definition, which we're going to be using throughout this workshop. But obviously, if anyone has any other opinions on this, um, we're going to be exploring, exploring varying perspectives on what anonymity is. Um, and we're very interested to hear that, because other perspectives is really what's quite key here as part of the multi-stakeholder discussion that the IGF is. Um, we're looking for a broad range of perspectives so we can have a very broad discussion in this workshop and that's what we're aiming for, a broad discussion on the issues that we've raised in the title and thus hope to increase everyone's understanding about uh, the topics, that, the topics um, that, that we're introducing here so, or investigating here. So I must stress that uh, especially as, as young people that this is our experience and our perspective, same with the industry panelists and our civil society representatives. Um, it's, it's their perspectives. So uh, that, uh, we're all limited in the fact that we can only talk about how we perceive things. So just to, uh, to put that out for everyone. Um, so quickly, the structure of the workshop. Uh, I'll first, uh, I'm going to um, introduce everyone. And everyone's uh, going to be talking, the team are going to be talking about uh, the survey that we conducted this summer, uh, which we're going to be uh, referencing throughout this uh, workshop. And then I'm gonna, we're going to uh, ask all our panelists the benefits of anonymity and its relationship with freedom of expression, followed by a five to ten minute reflection where we'll welcome questions from the floor. Uh, then we're going to talk about the challenges anonymity poses with specific consideration to internet governance. Finally, a longer discussion at the end and we hope to get uh, lots of feedback there. And then um, I'm going to make some concluding remarks. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists um, and just uh, for brevity, I'd like you to stand up, give a wave if you like, um, when I uh, say your name. So to begin with, the members of the YIGF project is here. That's the Youth Internet Governance Forum project. Uh, Matthew Jackman, 18 years old. Jad Passmore, 17 years old. <laughs> Mikaia Gordon, 15 years old. And uh, Jadine Reese Gardner, 15 years old. Um, we're all from the United Kingdom. Um, I'm Nicola Douglas, just for those of you who are uh, coming in now, I'm 18 years old as well. Um, and to um, introduce our other youth participants, uh, we have Vivian Lo Chan Yi from Hong Kong, uh, who's here with us from NetMission. Ella Ho, also from Hong Kong, and here with NetY. Uh, Luis Ivan Quende, a programmer, entrepreneur, and the advisor to uh, the Vice President of the European Commission. And Elena Valman, 
uh, from the Netherlands who is a, reading international history and is a master's student at London School of Economics. Um, um, we'll clap at the end. We, we've, got a lot more, we've got a few more panelists to get through yet. So, um, industry panelists now. Uh, we welcome Simon Milner, Director of Policy in the UK and Ireland for Facebook. Um, Anna Lucia Lennis, who's the Policy Lead for Google in Colombia, Peru and Ecuador. Um, Nigel Hickson, the Vice President of Stakeholder Engagement for Europe for ICANN. Um, and that's it for industry, civil society now. Uh, Donny Boo from Indonesia, who's here with us from ICT Watch. And uh, finally, last but definitely not least, Marianne Franklin, uh, who's the chair of the Internet Rights and Principles uh, Commission. And uh, <laughs> 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 for those of you who didn't know, um, and uh, for also uh, related with Goldsmiths University. Uh, we'd also like to mention Hannah Broadbent, uh, who's going to be our remote moderator today, hopefully bringing in some remote participants to the discussion to further increase perspective, uh, which is always helpful. I think we'll all agree. Uh, so now um, I'm going to hand over to the rest of the team who are going to talk about the survey that we conducted this summer. Um, and Jadine, I think you're going to begin. Um, we designed a survey to explore global opinions on anonymity, freedom of expression and internet governance. The survey was conducted in three phases of discussion, getting the ideas down and then finalizing them. Through an elimination process, we accumulated key questions that we thought suited our theme. The survey was promoted through ChildNet's international contacts and was open for a month. Open questions were included in the survey, blended with some closed ones to enable respondents to express themselves, a key element of our theme. In total, 1,382 people took part in our online survey. 50% of the respondents were 13 to 18 years old, and 40% were 19 to 35, and a further 10% were over 36 years old. There were responses from across 68 countries, and the highest of which came from Finland, the United Kingdom, China, and Mexico, and India. Other countries that took part included Afghanistan, Germany, Peru, and the United, um, United States. The results of our survey show that almost 65% of the respondents had interacted anon anonymously online in the past year, whilst the other 35% they, they either had not participated on, in anonymous acts or they did not know if they had. So we all admit and accept that anonymous use on the internet is now commonplace. And this was revealed in our survey with two-thirds saying that they'd acted anonymous, anonymously in the last year. But further to this, uh, actually a third of our respondents admitted that they actually used false names to achieve anonymity, which is extremely interesting. However, this you know, raises the question of trust. And does this breed a culture of distrust with anonymous use? We also found that there are um, many different methods of online communication, um, with the most common ones being um, leaving anonymous comments on services and using a service that you don't have to sign up for. We found from the survey that people use anonymous sites for two main reasons and then obviously a lot of other reasons. But the main reasons were to protect personal information. So 65% of the respondents said that's why they were using anonymous sites. And the second was to be safe or to feel safer. So perhaps we can see that there is perhaps a, a false feeling that anonymity is complete security and complete protection. But to you know, everyday users, anonymity provides the security and the privacy they're looking for. So protecting personal information and feeling safer were the two things that anonymity brought to our respondents. We also found that um, respondents would feel they can express themselves more freely online if they're anonymous. So um, without having fear of repercussions or to face consequences of their actions because of what they say online. And we found that nearly two-thirds said they uh, would be more likely to say what they wanted online if they were anonymous. Okay, so obviously with that, if they're feeling they can say things more freely, that does leave, uh, or lead to the kind of flip side of anonymous use, which is the negative side. And the abusive side of anonymous um, use. And so we found that 71%, which is a really quite high number, which uh, I'll come back to as well, felt that people were nastier if they were using uh, anonymous sites. If they felt they were nastier. So that's an, a negative effect from anonymous use. And actually, 37%, 37% of the people said that they had actually received abuse from anonymous sites. And 
25%, so that's one quarter of the respondents, admitted that they would actually be, would feel they would actually be nastier online. And th this comes back to a statistic we'll mention in a moment, which is that actually 86% of the people um, still believe that anonymous use and anonymous sites are crucial, you know, possibly stretching into the should, should there be a right online. So it's interesting that these people highlight that there are abuses from anonymous use, but then they still see the necessity for anon anonymity online. And just delving again into these negative reasons for anonymity, because there are quite a few which we've discovered uh, through our survey. Um, uh, reasons such as bullying, hate speech, sexual harassment, identity theft, and the spreading of false information and rumours. Um, we found that um, the percentage of people that thought that um, people were more abusive when they're anonymous online um, was more prevalent in the younger age brackets, um, with peaks on our graphs at 84% in the 16 to 18 year category. And um, there's a very de um, clear decline after that in people that agreed with the statement um, as the age ranges um, goes up to 36 years plus. But as always, we can't forget the positive implications of anonymous use. So, and, and half, or well, 50% of our respondents actually said that they saw good from an, uh, anonymous use. And they gave various different you know, examples, help and advice. They actually felt they could give compliments more easily because they weren't attached to them, which is you know, that's a great thing as well. Um, privacy, they could speak their mind, they could have a voice. And also to the extent for human activists, they could criticize governments. So they all kind of tie under the, the kind of bracket of freedom of, freedom of expression, which obviously is hugely linked to anonymous use, how people feel more free online. Um, and also, if you've missed any of the stuff we said and you want to find out more about the survey, there are 50 copies on the door out. So, but we're just trying to introduce the ideas and the findings we found from our survey, which we'll use throughout this workshop. So to summarize the points that we found, um, the majority of people felt that it's important to allow people to be anonymous online if they, if they wish to be. And supporting this statement, we had 86% of our respondents agree with it. So as in the offline world, we control what information we share with different people. And anonymity can be a way of, of separating the personal information you might share with family or friends from the information you might share with someone you don't know, say a stranger. That is on. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for that, uh, everyone. I think uh, it's very important to, I, I quite like the idea, actually, it's something Matthew mentioned, but the idea of random acts of kindness on the internet. We're going to go into focus about, you know, uh, positives um, later on. Uh, first of all, I'm going to begin with some introductory questions, um, but just, just to reiterate the fact that uh, we'll be referencing the survey throughout, and again, it is by the door if you'd like a copy at the end. I'll say it again, because we've got 50 copies there, and we, we'd like them all to go, so do, do pick one up on the way out. Um, so uh, just to begin with some introductory questions, I'm going to uh, say three, you can answer all, um, and this is directed to our youth panelists, so you can answer all three or you can answer just one. Um, and I'm going to come to Vivian first actually, so just to say the questions, how do you define anonymity? What does anonymity mean to you in practice? And do you feel that you can be completely anonymous online? Yeah, hello, I'm Vivian from NetMission, and I think anonymity means that I don't have to reveal any personal information online, so that I can be nobody in the internet. I can be whatever person that I want. And it means that I can do something that I don't want to, to do in the reality, or something that I want to do in the reality, but I was confined by some various factors. For example, like I feel bad for my school policy, but yet as a good student, I cannot blame the school directly or express my feelings to it. So if I go online and be anonymous, I can actually leave a comment in my school website so that they will understand what I feel bad about without really knowing who I am. But however, I don't think that I can be completely anonymous online. Even though I hide all my information, like my name, my sex, my um, uh, personal email address, etc. Still, I believe there are professional technicians who can track my IP address and track all the information that I left online. So probably, it's my opinion on these three questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vivian. Um, just, I think we'll come to uh, Lewis. Would you like to say anything about this right now? Um, come to Lewis if he wants to say anything, and I know Olina definitely does. So. Yeah, so um, I think anonymity is more like uh, my, that my online activity cannot be tracked or logged in any like technical way. 
So when I browse a website, for example, I, uh, the ISP or the government or the website doesn't know that uh, that account is um, just linked to me. Uh, what was the second question? Sorry. Um, so what does it mean in practice? Oh, what does it mean yeah, in practice? In practice, yeah, in practice means exactly that. That when I log in on a website, for example, uh, the website doesn't uh, like track down my activity to my person. Um, and I don't feel really anonymous because, uh, I mean, when you are, for example, creating a fake account in a, in a, you know, in an incognito tab in Chrome or whatever browser you are using, um, so the website doesn't know who you are because you are creating a fake account with, a, you know, with an incognito tab or window or whatever you are using. But your ISP is still like tracking every single HTTP request you are you are doing to their servers. So it's like the ISP or the government, you know, with the NCA scandal, it is very clear that they are tracking us down. So, uh, so the website may not really know who you are really, but the ISP does, and the government in the end also does, in the case of the US. So I don't feel anonymous in any way. Okay, and Erwin, would you like to answer some of those questions? Yeah, I will answer to say something about defining anonymity. I think if you talk about it, it's really important that you realize you're talking about a relationship. You're only anonymous in relation to somebody else. So, for example, if you're on a forum, you may, might be anonymous to the other users of this forum, but you're probably not to the moderators or the people, the owners of the website. So, you really need to be aware of that. and. That's why I feel you're never really anonymous, but Louis said you can always, almost always be traced back to you. So I think if you talk about being anonymous, you really depend on the website who's protecting your privacy. So you ha always have to trust, in a sense, somebody with your information. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to come to Jack now. I think you have a comment on this. Um, for me, I believe anonymity is an invasion of accountability and an invasion of the consequences um, of our actions. It sort of provides a mask um, of freedom and a mask for confidence, um, which can be used for good um, in some cases and can give someone the power to change a personality and change human behaviour online. Um, I don't believe you can be completely anonymous online. Anything and everything you do online has the potential to be traced through data aggregation, amongst other means. And with advancements in technology um, in this day and age, and at the rate they've been evolving in the 21st century, I believe there will become a time um, where nothing's hidden and users will all be stripped of anonymity and sort of exposed to themselves. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Jadim, would you like to make a comment on this? Um, I define anonymity as using a service without a substantial amount of people knowing your true identity and at times without accountability. Um, I don't use any anonymous services, but in practice it would definitely mean to me someone who I couldn't identify. Um, I don't feel that you can be completely anonymous because you can be traced by using an IP address for example and many people who are in touch with the technological side of things have those around it and but I think that people um, who wouldn't bother to investigate who you are, if you were anonymous, yeah, you could be completely anonymous to them. So, yeah. Thanks, Jadine. I think what we, uh, the sort of vibe I was getting from the panelists there is that so anonymity in itself does not exist. We can be traced. Uh, we're all aware that there is data out there about us and that you know, the government, it's available there for people to find out about us. But at the same time, from a pers uh, perspective of young people, I think that it's been identified that maybe, as uh, Alina was saying, that we are not anonymous to other people on the service, that we are, remain anonymous to other people on the service. Um, so that you know, if there is a case of cyberbullying going on, you're not necessarily able to find out who that is. Um, who that is that is sending you the on anonymous abuse because as Jadine was saying we are not uh, technologically advanced enough uh, because I personally don't know uh, the second thing about IP addresses I'm sure you all do I personally don't but um, I think I think it's an interesting an interesting distinction to make and I think it's something we should all keep in mind in, in that nature of anonymity um, in that yes it doesn't technically exist but uh, it, in some people's perspective it, it definitely is there and it, it is a problem um, so uh, I think we'll move on to the first sort of section of our discussion, which is the benefits of anonymity and its relationship with freedom of expression. So I'm going to start. 65% uh, of the respondents in our survey said that they chose to be anonymous uh, in order to protect their personal information. And uh, sort of to carry on from that, um, I'm asking the panelists, why might you choose to be anonymous instead of using your real name? So Alina, I think you have something to say here. 
Um, yeah, I wanted to say something about uh, young people, but then more maybe about uh, in the section 1923, because in countries where social change and political change happens, it's most of the time it's really young countries. So young people can bring about change. And then I think the internet is nowadays a really important means for them to communicate their ideas, to be criti critical of the go their government, and to bring about change. So in that sense, it's really important for them to be aware of the fact that it's always, almost always possible for the government to trace down who they are. And there are so many cases of bloggers being arrested. So I think that this awareness should be there, but then if they are aware of that, I think they can still be anonymous to some extent, that they cannot be traced and they can really express their opinions and can bring about a change. Thank you very much, Lena. I think uh, we're going to come to Vivian now. Would you like to say something about this? Yeah. I'd like to pass this time to Ella. Do you want to say something? Um, personally, hello, hello. Um, personally, I I agree that you know I would want to be anonymous instead of using my real name because first of all, you know if I'm anonymous, then obviously people wouldn't know who I am on the internet. Like I'm able to just you know speak out you know on my own opinions and just say whatever I want on the internet without having anyone know who I really am. And personally I feel that if I you know if I were anonymous and if I use my real name I would feel that you know I, I'm being exposed on the internet. Like someone knows my name and, and someone knows uh, that this is my opinion. So you know basically uh, you know I would rather be anonymous than you know use my uh, thanks very much. Um, I think we're going to come to Matthew now. Thanks very much. Yes, yeah, so as you said, you know, people want to protect their personal information, but I kind of see it as, as more the kind of power and, and the security aspect. And also, you know, it's simple, and there's, there's almost no stress to anonymity. There's no worry about your, your personal reputation because it's, it's not necessarily you. You're, you're just kind of blank and, and the words come out. So I'd like to kind of put this in a, a kind of if you imagine internet use in a kind of inter interview situation and you imagine a kind of face-to-face -face interview is real name usage and you're judged on how you look, your image, everything you say is judged. But a, a kind of anonymous interview would be over text and you're sitting in your massage chair and it's all very nice and very simple. Okay, so you see the, you see the positives for the anonymous use, you know, it's stress-free, okay, it's good. And, and, you're, and there's no prejudice, there's no kind of, you're not judged on anything because it's just the words you're saying in the interview. But then, the face-to-face -face is, is more authentic, it's, it's more real, okay, and you're judging everything, so you want everything to be the best it can for yourself. And you'll notice, I guess, in this workshop, when you pass the mic around, you will turn around to have a look at the person who's speaking. You know, you, you don't just listen to their words, you look at them, you judge them, then you start making interpretations. So that, that to me, is, you know, the kind of distinctions there. And, and I, I, see, I see the positives why people choose anonymous use, but the trust issues which are raised with that, are very, you know, important. Thanks. Thanks very much, Matthew. Do you want to make another comment? There? If I can respond to that. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, what I noticed in this panel, which is really interesting, I think that we are talking about the reality and that the offline world is maybe more real. And I don't necessarily agree with that, but I think your, your online identity can just be a bigger part of you as your offline identity. They may be different, but they're still a part of you. So. I have to say that I don't think um, it's more real. It is just as real. Internet is a part of our reality, actually. Do you want to respond to that, Matthew? Yeah. Okay. Okay. There you go. Okay, it's it's interesting because I think you, you when you're using on a site, you, a site, sorry, you kind of start afresh. Okay, you start. It, obviously, it's you. You know, I'm formulating the ideas that I'll put in an anonymous site, but I'm starting completely blank. Yes, I will form an identity in the kind of anonymous site I use if I, if I go back to it, but essentially I'm, I'm standing clean, so I'm not really using any of my stuff. Um, yes, it's, the, you know, I, I, I agree there's a lot of connections between there, but I think that anonymity kind of removes you. It, it makes you, the behavioral changes make you think in a different way and act in a different way on that anonymous site, which is, yeah. Can you agree with that, Alina? Is that something that you see? You see the point of, or would you like to respond again? I'm quite enjoying this, so okay. <laughs> Going on across me, so it's it's wonderful. It's good to good to get the discussion in. So I think if, we, if we've finished up with that question, then I'll I'll move on to sort of looking at sort of more positive uses of anonymity. Uh, we've um, seen some; they've been mentioned on the table, but I think uh, Mikhail, you definitely have something to say here. So.
Okay. Well, positive anonymity was something that we did look at on our survey. And we found out that over half of our respondents have seen anonymity being used positively online. And more 16 to 18 year olds have seen positive anonymity being used online than actually experience negative abuse directly. And one quote that we did get was from a female from Mexico, which it, who is aged 13 to 15, and she said that she uses anonymity to stand up for someone. And in another male from Finland, also in the same age bracket, said, people often come to help anonymously when someone is being bullied by someone else who is also on an anonymous account. And I think that this does show that being anonymous gives people the confidence to stand up for others where they might not have done in real life. And also, um, it gives people like the kind of confidence that they might not um, normally have. And another male from the US, aged 26 to 35, said, I am trans but not out on the internet. When I talk about trans issues, I don't want it to be connected with the same person that other people know. And I think that um, this is because anonymity allows people to seek help and advice about subjects that they are embarrassed about or don't want people in their personal life offline to actually know about. So thank you. Thanks for that, uh, Michaela. I think we definitely get that uh, anonymity does give more confidence. And um, I think Ella also has something to say about this. That's okay. Or uh, Vivian if either one of you wish to respond. Um, I definitely agree with, with what you said. I feel that, you know, teenagers nowadays, like in real life, they would feel, you know, uh, completely afraid of being judged like, on whatever they say. So, in you know, it really helps them to uh, have that confidence online. So basically, you know, they get confidence from, you know, seeing stuff online in contrast to often where they would, you know, feel afraid. And also, um, for instance, if you know, if a teen teenage girl she she you know, she suffers from you know personal uh, problems like for some she has problems in school then she would be able to tell uh, people online like anonymous people online maybe chat rooms or discussion forums without uh, you know having fear of being you know judged basically. Thanks very much for that, Ella. I I think it's definitely a a point to make that that fear of being judged is is always there and it's very prevalent uh, for young people, especially when it comes to societal norms and um, things and what you do and do not feel comfortable saying in front of your peers in an offline environment may be something that you feel um, incredibly com comfortable saying in an on online environment if you are anonymous um, or indeed even if you are not, as as the case may be, as some people do want uh, those opinions to be linked back to them. Um, so uh, I think. Uh, aware we've been neglecting our other panelists, so I'm going to come to you now. Um, how does anonymity impact freedom of expression? Um, so uh, we're looking for positive uses here, maybe some global case studies that you could possibly um, possibly offer uh, to the discussion. So I'm going to come first to uh, Marianne. Uh, so just to to recap, um, <laughs> sorry, I was tweeting. I was tweeting. Um, Sorry, uh, so I was sort of listening. I can't yeah. actually talk. Yeah, no, it's, so I'm sure. I'm sure you are. Uh, yeah. um, so, and then the impact of all years of oppression and uh, uh, positive voices. Yes. Um, I suppose I, my my example for today. So I'll give you the first half of the example from the positive side. I um, have written about this young woman called the once homeless girl. Uh, 16 years old when her family found themselves um, homeless through the mortgage. The uh, the crisis, the economic crisis in 2008, very unfortunate. She was able to go online, make contact with people through a gifted mobile phone, blogging eventually as the once homeless girl. In other words, quite anonymously, because homelessness is a shameful condition for her, for many people. It's also one of the many forgotten communities. So this allowed her, through this persona, to discuss many issues about being homeless and what happens to you when you come from a good background, as she said, and in this terrible position. So I just call it having an avatar, having another identity online allowed her to say this. And that was extremely powerful for her and her blog became extremely um, significant and Huffington Post picked it up and I will continue the story later. Thank you very much. So I, I assume we're going to get the challenges, the challenges a bit later. Yes, yes. Oh, good, good. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, Donnie, if I could just come to you now. I, I know that uh, you, uh, your organization um, does some work specifically with human rights, and I wondered if you could give us any uh, perspective on how an anonymity impacts, impacts this. Yes, yeah, so um, 
First of all, I want to say that anonymity, more or less, is uh, is part of the right to be unavailable in the internet because because this is a hyper-connected world. So we have, we have to we have to right to be unavailable. But it uh, depends on the in in the in the use of the uh, anonymity itself because we know that there's uh, two reason why people do anonymity or why people are the, the, uh, online anonymously. First, because they want to uh, to be freedom of consent and the second is freedom of uh, responsibility. So for the people who choose to, to be uh, anonymous because they want to you know freedom of consent, but it's, it is it's good because it's part of the freedom of the online because it's part of the human right. But if people want to do online uh, to do anonymous because they want freedom of uh, responsibility, that's very bad. Uh, sometimes uh, the people they just you know just think that anonymous is not is not good. For example, for 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 the, uh, some cases in Indonesia, uh, if you if you speak or if you voicing about corruption, for example, or you have information about corruption and you like a whistleblower and you put your name on all your data clearly on the internet and will harm you your or your family. So you have to you have to share it uh, anonymously, but then because uh, because the people have power, then they can you know persuade the mass media to say that anonymous is bad. So the challenge is not only how we, we can become anonymous, but the challenge is how the people understand how the people we can get to educate the people how to choose. Uh, which one information is uh, legitimate and credible and which one is not because the press information the garbage information not only because it's anonymous sometimes the mass media also giving the the press information so it's not about anonymity or not it's because uh, it's about the credibility of the source of information okay thank you very much for that um i'm just I'm aware of my time, and I just ask you a, a question I'd say for later, but just a quick question for the both of you, if you, you could just give a, a one-word brief common answer. What? Do you think anonymity is necessary um, for freedom of expression? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, Donnie, do you have anything for it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, a strong I, yes from that side, then. And, and I'd like to give a brief uh, comment but as well. I, I think I welcome your comment, Nigel. Thank you very much. For, for everyone great. who doesn't know and forgotten since I mean, the start, I'm aware Nigel hasn't spoken, no, Vice President. Uh, no, 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 no. Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean the, the, the answer is yes, but the, but the comment is, if we go back to before the internet, and the internet is the world, the in cyberspace, you know, let's forget this stupid term, the internet is real, you know, this is the reality of today. My generation... When we wanted to protest, we didn't, you know, we didn't have the internet. We went to rallies, we went to demonstrations, we went to the streets, we went to Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park and we stood up and we shouted at politicians and we shouted at anyone that would listen. And yes, we wanted to be an anonymous at some time. We didn't necessarily want people to know who we were. Other times, yes, we wanted to give our names because we wanted to represent an organisation or a society. So surely this is the balance that's a reality. I think that's a, a very interesting point you make, Nigel. That uh, sort of we do want to be anonymous. Maybe if you're if you're politicised, you want to be anonymous to the powers that be, perhaps. But uh, to the other people that you're trying to connect with, I think it's it's important that your name is known. I think uh, this was mentioned in our workshop earlier this week. Um, workshop 19 uh, was talking about something else with uh, Louise Bennett. So we've we've taken aboard some ideas from that, and I should be uh, I'd be welcome any comments from the floor later. Um, so um, I'm aware that uh, all this discussion of anonymity maybe has been perturbing some of our panelists because uh, uh, I think we're going to come to industry representative Simon now. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you how you make provisions to encourage freedom of expression because we have heard a lot about um, have heard a lot about how anonymity is uh, necessary. Uh, anonymity is necessary to encourage it, but I think we'd like some thoughts from you on this. Um, so, uh, I think most people here will know that one of the decisions Mark Zuckerberg made in the very early days of Facebook is it would be a real name environment. Um, and actually, I think without that, Facebook wouldn't be what it is today. It wouldn't have grown to be a community of over a billion people um, because actually people like to connect with people they know in the real world. Um, and that's what makes Facebook um, such a strong success. But it's also an incredible platform for freedom of expression. And that's partly because of some of the tools we provide. So people can create a page about something they really care about, 
um, and uh, can communicate with millions of people by that page without necessarily revealing their personal identity. Uh, and that's something that people find very powerful within Facebook. So any suggestion that Facebook's real name policy has inhibited its ability to be a platform for freedom of expression is clearly proven wrong by the number of campaigns and causes that have been promoted via our platform. I think that's a, a definite point to make there. Um, Anna Lucia, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, thank you. Well, I think that the, the anonymity is, uh, is part of the freedom that we have to, uh, and, and the options that we have in the internet and all the tools that the different companies are providing on all the freedom that gives us the internet to express ourselves. So then we have the opportunity to, to, check, to decide how I want to express myself, or, and it depends. Sometimes I want to express something to my parents, but not to my friends. Or some, it, it depends on the, it, it, it's, a, it's a reflector of the real world, but, and our real relations, and, and sometimes I want to share a picture or something with my friends, uh, and I want to express that it's me, I want to look. And sometimes I, I'm very disappointed and I, or I want to, for example, uh, search for medical information that maybe I don't want to, uh, to express like, like me, maybe I want to be like an incognito or, uh, or use a pseudonym or uh, something different. So this is a, this is a feeling that, the, that we should have in the internet and it's not a, and I think that we need to think all the time in the balance between the individual freedom, the civil liberties, and additionally the, the, the protection of the citizens. Uh, and sometimes uh, I, 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 I totally agree that we have a huge concern the issue about uh, the surveillance of the, or what is, what is happening with my uh, data. But there's a lot of issues that we need to, 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 to analyze and, and every circumstance is different. So it's, a, it's something like between a balance in the regulations and the freedom of expression and the rights. So we have to consider all of this and we have to learn. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just briefly going to come to some more of our panel members, but I'm aware there are questions from the floor, so I'll take you in about, uh, we'll give it a few minutes or so. Uh, do we have any remote participants, participants that want to make a comment, Anna? Just nothing at the moment? No comments yet. Okay. Um, so just, I'm, Anna Lou mentioned briefly there, sometimes you want to use a synonym and sometimes you want to make comments as yourself. So I'm going to ask, uh, Jack and Jadine had some thoughts on sort of, can anonymity be used to help develop and support identity? Uh, for example, using a pseudonym or a fake name, uh, building a reputation for yourself online as someone who can be trusted, but not necessarily with a real name. So, uh, Jack, do you want to share some thoughts on this? Uh, well, the development and exploration of an identity is something that I think is becoming increasingly more important as technology evolves and sort of changes through the years. Um, and people that may be new to technology um, or services such as social networks like Facebook and Twitter um, will naturally take an online persona that may be slightly different to their real life so they can experiment and choose who they want to be. And the only issue that may arise from this exploration is that anonymous services um, or the use of pseudonyms, for example, um, may give rise to an abusive user or um, as the mask of anonymity sort of cloaks human emotion as that isn't, doesn't exist um, with anonymity online. Uh, I think it's Jodine, would you like to? Thanks. Um, I think it can, well, more so than I did before because I used to solely believe that if you're, un if you're using an unidentified viable username, then you can't possibly be developing your identity or just making another one. And I couldn't really see how just adding to your identity count added to the quality of or supported your true identity. However, upon getting the results of our survey, my opinion has differed. Firstly, now I have interpreted from the results that people find their true identity through exploring online and some may want to do that anonymously. Also, a female from Sweden in the 36 plus category addressed her pseudonym as that name is me, perhaps more so than a legal name. I see that as interesting because it shows just because your parents have given you a name that they may or may not want you to, may or may not want your true identity to stem from, it doesn't mean to say that that is the real you. And so some may feel they can develop their true identity much more freely and without judgment through being anonymous. Uh, thanks, Jadine. Um, I think we're going to come to Jack and then Alina, and then I'm quite aware of my time, so I'm just going to 
add in another question really quickly, but you can come back to it. Okay, sure, sure. Um, so uh, just Jack then, and uh, Jack, I think if you want to, you can uh, sort of answer the question now about uh, using anonymous sites to avoid accountability and the potential consequences of sharing your views. So uh, just. Oh, well, I'll come back to the um, the question that we just had about um, online exploration of identity, um, and I'll I'll come to our survey now because we have some amazing results um, that um, that were shown from this. Sixty five percent of um, people said they are anonymous online to protect their personal information. Um, which is great because then you get to avoid data aggregation because that isn't always the safest way to explore identity by putting your personal information out there. And also 29% of people said it was to protect their reputation, so obviously from employers or a professional capacity there. And furthermore, 36% of, um, of people use an account with a false name. And these results could suggest that people are using anonymity online to explore their identity and have the chance to be someone different and act or behave in a different way online to how they usually would in real life. And we've got a couple of quotes some from our survey because we gave people the chance to sort of express themselves rather than just tick boxes and have statistics. And this one's from a female in Finland in the 16 to 18 year category. Um, she said, teenagers are still trying to figure out who they want to be and being anonymous on the internet is a great way to try different social roles safely. And I couldn't agree more. It's all about safety online. And it's great. To, you can, it, I haven't got a problem with being, being anonymous if you want to be. I think you should be allowed to be. As long as you're doing it safely, that's the key point. And uh, many people also mentioned that anonymity online is fun and should be fun and um, has the capacity to be um, fun. And uh, we have another quote from a male also in Finland in the 16 to 18 year old category um, who said it's fun to have a fictional identity for games. Um, and I agree with um, Xbox Live and things like that. Um, you do end up having your own little avatar on your own little person when you're online gaming. 31% um, of 16 to 18 year olds were anonymous online because it is fun. So that's 31% of all our younger users. And um, the higher percentages um, for this question were prevalent in the younger age brackets. I think what I really love about that is that there are so many different positive uses of anonymity. Obviously, we haven't quite focused on the negatives yet, but I think you know we've got the random acts of kindness. We've got um, the idea of being politicized and uh, expressing your opinion, uh, supporting uh, supporting causes that you agree with. Obviously, uh, Facebook provides for that in other ways. Um, but the the an idea that anonymity can perhaps do more so on other sites. Um, so. Yeah, I think everyone, I, I think we probably do have some comments from the floor by this point. Um, so I'm aware I have missed out some of the questions I intended to do, but um, oh, it's a little bit ad-libbing, isn't it? So uh, <laughs> let's go. Uh, who do I have from the floor? Um, I see someone at the back. Pippa, you're ready to run. Okay. Um, so someone at the back. Um, do I remember um, name, organization you're affiliated with. Uh, I'd speak up clearly because some of the mics are a bit low. Not working. Okay. Hi. Right. Good evening, Mark here. We are young women. We are just in the spirit of this new revolution. I have a few questions to understand the survey. Uh, was the survey just produced in English, or you have also local version translated? Or is it? Uh, and there was a question regarding sexual identities, minorities, and all this issue. Certainly, we would like to say that anonymity, I mean, in principle, works for everyone. So, principle, you have or you don't. If, you, if we don't have the anonymity as a principle, we cannot cope with all the negative side of not having it. If we have the principle, then we can work out how to balance rights. Because principles, ones, they are or they are not. But I'm really interested in knowing which kind of question we're addressing all the other minority issues that make people question of life or death to be in line with anonymous and so forth. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. I'll respond to uh, what you mentioned about the survey very briefly. Um, yes, it was translated into, I think, uh, five different languages, um, and I would imagine it w uh, Spanish probably was uh, the main other one because uh, Childnet is a, is a charity, a charitable organization, and um, it was through their contacts that they managed to find the people who uh, took their time to translate it, so um, uh, they're very grateful for those people for doing so. So, fortunately, we weren't able to get it in all languages, um, 
as anyone who works with translating will know that is an impossible task to do a lot of the time unless you're like Facebook and have a billion users who can translate for you at any time. But I don't think Childnet quite has that many contacts yet, um, unfortunately. But um, is there any comments um, from the floor? Uh, uh, come over here. Um, again, name an organization you're affiliated with. My name is Jorge de Sierra. I am a Mexican journalist. I am a part of the Freedom House delegation in, in this conference. Um, congratulations for the panel. I just um, would like to make a quick point in regards to anonymity. Um, this is, of course, a right. We have to, to have the right of anonymity on, on the net. But in certain parts of Mexico and Latin America, anonymity is a matter of life or death. Particularly because uh, citizens who are uh, Twitter and using Twitter to to report about drug violence can be killed, and they are protecting actively their identity. They are using all tools available to protect anonymity, um, Tor, in, in Giverboard, in in Android phones or um, whatever. So for them, I think that's, that's crucial. And I'd agree with you. For some people in the world, anonymity is crucial. It protects them on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it was definitely something that arose last year. I was participating in a workshop um, about Speak No Hate, and we were um, talking to a youth blogger there who uh, was uh, very much shared with us stories about how anonymity has saved his life on a number of occasions. Um, uh, do we have any other comments from the floor? Uh, one over here, one over here, uh, possibly one over there. Uh, we'll see if we have time. Can, can we please keep it brief? Because I'm aware there's so many people, but um, please do go ahead. Rita Carr from the Digital Opportunities Foundation in Germany. Um, in German law, we have laid down in the privacy and data protection law the right to anonymity and synonymity. So I was wondering whether you can extract the figures for Germany if you've got respondents from Germany if that's related to the legal situation. And the other question is whether you have knowledge about the legal situation in other countries where there are similar laws like in Germany. Thank you. Sure, I'm, I'm sure we'd be delighted. I, I also was actually quite interested in the respondents from Germany because I was aware of the, uh, the situation there. Uh, so I think it would be definitely, um, unfortunately, we weren't able to compare on a country basis because we didn't get the same number of respondents. So we thought it was better to do it. Uh, age trends seem to really stick out more for us. And I think some of the trends that have been brought up so far have been very interesting indeed. Uh, I think we have a comment from the front row here, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Robert Bodle, and I'm a college professor as well as a member of the Internet Rights and Principles Dynamic Coalition. I'm really interested in this topic, and I'm really enjoying this. Um, this has been a great panel. Um, I wanted to share a paper called Want to Be on the Top, Algorithmic Power and the Threat of Invisibility on Facebook, The Threat of Invisibility. And the paper looks at edge rank on Facebook and how your friends uh, posts are filtered for you. So uh, what this researcher is finding, Tanya Butcher, is finding that uh, people are, try are negotiating the tension between being not paid attention to and also being anonymous. So I'm wondering if you found in your findings, in your survey, or in your own experiences this tension between being noticed uh, and being anonymous. And that might le lead you to kind of uh, decisions that you wouldn't want to have to make. I think that's an interesting comment. I, it calls into mind a quote from Oscar Wilde. I think he said something along the lines of, uh, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. Um, particularly pertinent here. Alina, do you have a comment to make about, uh, in response to that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I wanted to respond to you because then I feel that there is not a tension between being anonymous or be but it's attention about being invisible and being noticed. And being anonymous is something I think is really different from it because your identity on the internet 
can be anonymous but really visible as well because it's an, a different identity you create, which, as I said, is still a big part of you. And I wanted to say something in response to what we said, talked about um, on the right to anonymity, and I think that shows it, how the tension between businesses and government on this subject uh, can be really important because, in a sense, the right to anonymity should be... Um, it's a government issue, I think. Like, maybe it should be a global law, but in the end, still now local governments are responsible to it. So, in countries like Mexico, where the government is, what he says, actually trying to interfere in that, I was just wondering how businesses should act in that sense, because do they have to follow the law in this country and give up people's right to anonymity as well, or should they be take a political stand and do not do that? And I think Helena just highlighted a very contentious issue there, um, which I think a lot of uh, a lot of companies may struggle with, and businesses too. Um, now, I'm looking at the time, and it says 11:55. I think uh, a couple more comments from the floor uh, should be okay, because uh, um, we'll get some more discussion at the end of the workshop. But here and here, and that's the final two comments I'm taking for this bit section. I'll come to you at the end. Um, I promise we timetable in some more discussion, so don't worry. Hey, uh, my name is Carmen and I'm from Estonia, from the University of Bartha. I'm doing PhD on uh, internet and liability issues. Um, my comment is regards only the German legal system and also Dr. Robert Bottle's uh, comment uh, before me uh, that about the German and the anonymity there, that is a legal principle there. Uh, I think the Germany, German legal system is a very good example because they really have a lot of court cases regarding anonymity. Uh, there have been court cases relating teachers rating portals, uh, doctors rating portals, and so forth. However, now when Facebook um, uh, enacted their last uh, privacy uh, rules on 2012, then German Data Protection Authority actually challenged it in the court because the uh, privacy rules have real names Right name policy in it. So Facebook kind of says that you can't be anonymous anymore, at least when you register to be a user, because when they find out that you provided false name, they will, uh, uh, you're obliged to present them a copy of photo ID. So just to give everybody a notice that this has been uh, in the court, right? The court first, um, first level it was ruled down. They said that, well, you can't apply German law because Facebook is situated in Ireland, in, in Europe. But uh, the authority has, like, is promised and publicly declared that they will, uh, they will go forward with it. So just um, so the Facebook is not really uh, anonymous, and so you can't really be uh, invisible anymore. Thank you very much. Um, that's a, it's an interesting comment. I think the German example is is a very good one to bring in for this issue. Um, and I'll go to our last comment from the floor, and then we're going to start the next section of our workshop, which will be uh, the challenges and limited poses. Hi, my name is uh, Caroline Tengia. I work for the Association for Progressive Communication in um, the Women's Rights Program of the organization. And we're working like since the past, um, the past three, four years on uh, a project that is really uh, focused on sexual rights and internet rights. And um, I just wanted to bring the input that like for the research that we've been doing and also like the recent survey that we've done with sexual rights activists like anonymity is it like comes as a major point of discussion and it's it's extremely important for activists um, just wanted to respond to um, in, in regards to real name policies on Facebook I think it in this activist activism especially for uh, people that cannot be identified um, because it's a matter of life and death, actually. Uh, but that you still need, need to organize to, uh, and then communicate with others to, to, uh, demand, uh, to make their demands heard. Yeah, I think yeah. Our, our survey definitely reflected that uh, with uh, sort of the respondents who identified with the LGBT community uh, were saying that anonymity was a necessity for them and that in order to uh, to come out or to uh, just just talk about the issues that they didn't feel that they could talk about with their friends. Um, so that's in, in a more social situation, uh, but also on, on the level above that, um, just being an activist for the community itself um, and in countries where uh, holding holding such views is a matter, again, of, of life and death, as, as we seem to be returning to. So um, I'll end that part of the discussion there. 
um, but uh, don't worry, I will uh, come to any more um, questions at the end. So just to begin section two then of the workshop, the challenges posed by anonymity and that this was specific consideration to internet governance. So um, I think we're going to come to uh, Alina first for the question, that uh, how does anonymity impact on behavior online? Would you like to answer that or shall we? No. No? Okay. <laughs> that, that's one. Um, okay, in which case, Ella, I think you definitely would like to answer this question. Um, Ella, uh, in fact, Ella can tell you because she's probably better better prepared than I am, so. Um, hello? Hello? Yeah. Um, it's pretty simple. I feel that um, anonymity, you know, how anonymity impacts um, behavior online is that um, some people, they may feel that, you know, when they're online, and and be anonymous, then they wouldn't be able to, you know, be identified for other people. And this leads to the point where they would like abuse anonymity. Like they would say that because they don't know, uh, because they know that people wouldn't know who they are, then they they will you know abuse this and just you know do whatever they want or say whatever whatever they want on the internet. And you know you know for instance bullying, it, they would feel more comfortable to bully someone on the internet because you know. You know they wouldn't, you know, get caught and stuff. Thanks very much, Al. Thanks very much, Al. I think um, Alina would like to respond to that one. So, go ahead. Yeah, I remember I had something to say because um, I feel that anonymity online can do a lot of good things as well as bad things. But I think what is really important and also dangerous is a false sense of anonymity and what that does to people. So. That's what I think is a big problem. People say something and they feel they're anonymous but, and they feel safe and then people find out and they're in a lot of trouble. So that's when I think the key issue here is still awareness about that anonymity online is virtually impossible still. So uh, we're getting that, the, the impossibility of an anonym, anonymity again. Um, so Matthew, I think you want to make a comment here. Yeah, no, no, no I'll, I'll say something here. Um, for me, anonymity does remove some of the kind of social norms um, and really it becomes a bit more spontaneous in what you say. It's, it's just how I, I view anonymity. I feel it's more a conscious stream of thought and I think less about the, the implications. So I say something that is probably more provocative and I think the gentleman at the front there was saying that what are the tensions? And you know, you want to be noticed. So, so maybe anonymity provides that kind of platform to be a bit more provocative and thus you, know, you say things that maybe, you know, you don't actually feel attached to you, but you do it to be noticed. Um, because, you know, it removes the kind of the restraint and the ethics and behavior be does become, in my opinion, a bit more reactive um, with emotions rather than reason, um, which, you know, guide your, guide your actions, um, which were just my, my thoughts on that. Thanks, Matthew. Um, Marianne, <laughs> I thought I'd surprise you again. So, yeah. Um, oh, good, good. Um, so, Impacting on online okay. behavior. We got it this time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, once home is girl part two, we will now call her Nadia. Because as she became more confident and uh, more visible, because I'm enjoying this, this important distinction here, became more visible amongst the blogging community, she was contacted by a wonderful activist who's been doing um, homeless TV. So we met her in a large global city on the planet, which I will show her name for the moment, Anonymous and uh, did a video of her, and that's how I discovered her. So here is her name, here is her face, here she was. So I became interested because this has been research I've been doing for some years, and I organized an interview. Okay, so she tells me that as she became more prominent as one time as girl, she started to discover, she, this was on Facebook, she started to link up to Facebook, she got linked in. She was having friends appear that she'd never knew. So this is the sort of automated linking in that Facebook does. Um, this had some consequences she started to feel not so comfortable with. For instance, there were friends who weren't um, saying, they were saying things she didn't like, and someone else set themselves up as homeless girls, so she immediately had this issue with her profile, with her persona. So we're not talking about anonymity so much as having another persona. Um, so she decided that she became more confident, I'll be finishing in a minute, um, that she would actually come out and actually tell the world who she really is because she wanted to advocate for homeless issues. And this has been picked up by Huffington Post, which insists, of course, you sign off as someone or real, but I would change what real is. So, of course, now we know as Nadia. I will not give her last name because of the third part of the story that I want to talk about. Um, 
so that's how far she got. She started to notice that she was being linked in automatically through these uh, mechanisms that social networking sites, commercial so social networking sites use to enhance the social networking, but also for market research. She started to notice that visibility, even though she was supposedly anonymous, had some sort of other layers you had not thought about. I know how to finish the story, but I'm not so sure where it will fit. So can I just leave it hanging at that point? We now know who she is, what she looks like, what her first name is. To be continued. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marian. Uh, that is, yeah, I'm, I'm excited now. I can't wait. Um, we'll definitely try and bring you, well, I'm definitely coming to you in the discussion at the end. Um, so I, mental note there. Um, so uh, I think that for, that, for that question, uh, the sort of how does it impact on, on online behavior, we, we definitely had a lot of, um, a lot of answers for that. And I think part of the part of the reason that uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, adopted the real name policy for Facebook is because um, he thought he, in some ways, um, and in lots of ways, it, it combats a lot of these challenges and it um, it stops them effectively. Uh, it it removes some of the harms and anonymity can cause. I really should be able to pronounce this right by this point in the workshop. Um, so I'm going to turn to industry representatives now. Um, what are the challenges anonymity poses for industry and how do you personally meet these challenges? Obviously, Simon, you've talked about um, you've talked about the real name, uh, the real name policy. If, if you'd like to, if you think there's anything else that you'd like to mention here, Nigel, uh, definitely coming for you because I know you have some interesting things. And um, Anna Lucia, is there anything, anything you'd like to mention here? Uh, anything? So, yes, yeah, do go um, on. So one thing that we changed recently on Facebook uh, was in regard to the ability of young people, including those of you who are under 18 on, uh, on this platform, to speak publicly. So we used to have a requirement that, oh, so we used to have an imposition that uh, anybody under 18 on Facebook, the maximum audience they could have was friends of friends. Um, and one of the things we were hearing from people is that that meant that their voice was restricted. So actually we were, we were not enabling them to be as visible as they might want to be on certain issues. So we've now changed that um, and young people 18 can post publicly. But what we also do is provide a lot of education around that to explain what that means. So if you are public, then that means other people can contact you. And you may get friend requests, and this goes to the point about Nadia, may get friend requests from people you don't know. Uh, and, that, and, and, that, and Facebook's policy and advice is to only accept friend requests from people you know in the real world. So we recognize that, that enabling a public voice for young people brings some challenges as well. And so not every safety organization has welcomed what we've done, uh, and, and we'll wait to see how it plays out uh, in practice. But I think I would say young people have, have definitely welcomed what you've done because um, I think part of freedom of expression is definitely being able to, to choose your audience. And, and if you want to broadcast publicly, then I think that should be uh, the choice made by the individual. So, um, Nigel, I uh, welcome your so comments. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Nigel, um, comments. So uh, just to, to return to the question, um, challenges anonymity poses for industry and how uh, I can, in particular now as an organization, uh, meet these challenges? Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, there's no doubting that, uh, you know, this, th th this debate is one of balance. And, you know, from what we've heard from the panel, from what we've heard, I'm, I'm sure, from business, from whatever. I mean, you, you know, there's no, there's no absolutes in this game. I mean, in terms of ICANN, what does ICANN do? It manages the top-level domain system. So we get involved in... Uh, anonymity in the sense that uh, if someone wants to register, register a, a domain name address, then do they do it in their own name? Can they do it in someone else's name? Can they remain anonymous? And under the, under the registry agreement we've just uh, concluded, yes, they can remain anonymous. But of course that only goes so far. And it's very important that certain individuals can remain anonymous when they join online groups, when they join sites, when they join whatever, because they might be doing things, protesting in, in their environments or, or doing things where their anonymity is very important to them. The challenge for industry, of course, is that one, it only goes so far. And for a, for a registrar of domain name addresses, depending where that registrar is located, that registrar will be subject to lawful access. I mean, if the police come along and knock on the door and say, you know, we're trying to find a posting that's been made, 
And there might be good reasons why the police want to find that posting that's been made or the security forces or whatever, because as someone, someone on the panel has said, that person might be using their anonymity to, to abuse or, or, or whatever, so there could be very good reason. On the other hand, of course, they could be using their anonymity to, to do something vital for their community. And therefore, there is always going to be a challenge, and that is a challenge to industry. But as long, and you know, and I'll finish here, but as long as there's transparency, and you know, we can take this where we, and we haven't mentioned transparency, but if, the, if people understand the conditions under which their anonymity can be challenged, then that, you know, that is, I'm not saying it's okay, but at least it's, it's a step in the right direction. But if they have no idea the conditions under which their anonymity could be I feel your pain, don't worry. the morning as well <laughs> can be challenged, then, then the whole edifice of what you're doing collapses because if you if you haven't got that if you haven't got that confidence, and it really it doesn't matter whether you're being anonymous or whether you're speaking, but if you haven't got that confidence to know what is happening to your information, then you're in a really serious position. Thank you very much for that, Nigel. And um, I think I think it's true. Just sort of uh, the idea behind it, I think, is is maybe an issue for education, educating people about what it, what is happening to their information. Uh, definitely something that was talked about for those of you who were in the privacy workshop this morning. Um, which a lot of these a lot of these issues were made, and there's a lot of crossover between the two. And I think a very very uh, fruitful area of discussion. So, uh, Anna Lucia, Thank if you'd you. like to continue. Uh, I just want to use one uh, word that word that one of the young panelists mentioned is trust. Uh, and and, it's a, and and the relation with the challenges that we have in the industry. I maybe highlight two two is two main issues. Uh, the importance uh, of the tools uh, that are available to protect our information and the education. Uh, it is very important to provide good information to young people and uh, how to uh, and and provide tools to protect the, our own data. And being anonymous is only one expression of the liberty and the freedom that we have to protect our privacy and to, uh, and to decide uh, or have the options to share the information with different audiences, uh, not the only one. Uh, that I think is a reflects some of the concerns that are included in the survey. And the other one is the, 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 the concerns about what happened with my information and, 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 and I think that it is, it is very, and the relationship with the govern, government request uh, and, uh, and uh, security that is very important to and we need the balance. So I think transparency here is very important. Um, for example, well, in 2010 we launched the transparency report, and I think it's something that is, uh, it, it is important for not only for, uh, for the elders like me, <laughs> it's, it's very important for young people to, to have information about the request that, uh, of the data of the citizens. And finally, uh, I want to conclude that it, uh, it reflects for, uh, for us, for the industry, that this kind of service shows a uh, uh, reflecting what is our users uh, thinking, no? And the young people, because sometimes we are thinking, uh, in, uh, we have round tables with people that is, um, I don't know, 30, 40, 50. And, and people that aren't using your services. So exactly. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, the future is that uh, young people that is, uh, are using our services and sometimes when we talk about the, uh, I don't know, the games and the avatar, I feel like, uh oh, I'm getting into this. <laughs> so it's, it's very, it's very important to understand and see what do you think, what means an avatar and, and the, and the, uh, and your concerns about your privacy, uh, and the avatar's privacy too. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a good thing that we, we conducted the survey then and are participating in this workshop indeed, uh, because we're all very keen to, to tell you what we think of uh, the services that you provide. Um, that's why we're here, after all. Um, as uh, so, just I think we're, we're going to continue now. Just it's a it's a bit of a, a curveball question, but um, 
Lewis, uh, could anonymity restrict the growth of the internet? Um, it, it's an interesting question, and the, the reason I come to you is because I know that uh, through the sort of uh, programming and development that you do, that uh, we're, we're just really wondering if you think your su your success, um, you have been very successful, um, I was very impressed when I read your bio, but uh, your success, could it have been limited if you had been anonymous? As in, uh, were you able to uh, sort of were you, were you better able to uh, promote yourself, as it were, uh, through the using of your real name, m maybe as opposed to a pseudonym, or as opposed to just being uh, completely anonymous? Um, uh, any thoughts? So I think it really depends. Um, for example, it would be really important for the growth of the internet, the, the anonymity, because uh, think about countries such as China, where there is like uh, the censorship. Uh, so they are getting to the internet thanks to the proxies, thanks to Tor, th thanks to Thing things that provide anonymity. So in that respect, uh, anonymity is helping like, uh, you know, grow in the internet with new users, new people accessing the, the services. But on the other side, anonymity is, is hurting like the big data movement because, um, you know, the, the quality of the services that we use nowadays in the internet, uh, it depends on the, on the data you provide, your input. So for example, um, Google sells me advertisement based on my interest so it makes the service better. But if you're anonymous, that kind of hurts the quality of the service you are trying to use. So on the one hand, anonymity is helping to grow the, I think, the, the user base of, of, you know, the quality of users accessing to the internet and accessing the services. But on the other hand, it's hurting, you know, the big data and all the, all the, all the backend infrastructure that is uh, gathering information about you to make the services better for you. So I think, yeah, I think it helps, but on the other side, it doesn't help too much. Thanks so much, Lewis. I'm definitely getting a sense of uh, balance, contention there, and I think that's a, a theme that seems to be running through this workshop, something I'm definitely going to try and reflect on, and no, definitely will reflect on in the conclusion. Um, so uh, just, and speaking of uh, conclusions, uh, we're, we're actually coming to the end of the second part of our discussion right now. Um, so I will... I'm just gonna I'm gonna ask a quick question from earlier, which I didn't mention uh, for fear of time, but it it's it's about the idea of accountability. So again, speaking from uh, a young person's pers young people's perspective, um, when it comes to interacting with our peers online, how accountable we think we are for the things that we say, um, and uh, I'll just find the question again for you. Uh, so uh, this is this one's directed at Jack and Micaiah, and I'm just asking them. If people in, uh, do you or do people in general use anonymous sites to avoid accountability and uh, potential consequences of sharing their views? So, Jack, I think I'll come to you first. Well, um, personally, I, I tend not to be anonymous online, um, as I believe whatever I'm going to say, I would say to anyone, and I would take the consequences of my actions, and I have nothing to hide. I wouldn't shy away from from accountability for that. Um, and more generally, I feel um, people tend to become anonymous to sort of shy away from accountability and, and hide from the consequences of what they say. Um, and this was revealed in our survey by 71% of people um, felt that others are more abusive when they're anonymous online. Um, and this could imply that anonymity provides a mask for people to become someone new and exhibit a different personality to what they would usually be in real life. Thanks, Jack. That's definitely an interesting opinion. Uh, obviously, we would set that against uh, people who use anonymity uh, uh, for activists. Um, activists who use anonymity uh, to protect themselves, but definitely in our social situation, we can see that people um, are less accountable for their actions, especially uh, as the online and offline worlds are the same. I, Nigel mentioned earlier there is no such thing as cyberspace, it's just one space now. Um, discussions that uh, bullying moves from uh, in school, in the playground, to, to on the internet, and uh, people, people can be less accountable for their actions there if they're able to use services anonymously. anonymously. Um, so, um, again, I know you definitely have something to say about this. So, again, uh, avoiding accountability and the potential consequences of consequences of sharing your views. Uh, wh what do you think? Well, is this one? Okay. Well, I don't personally use the internet um, anonymously because it's just not my thing. I like people to know who I am. My friends know what I'm saying, and it's perfectly fine if everyone knows what I'm saying. It's nothing too controversial. Um, I will draw from the survey where a female from the Netherlands aged 26 to 35 said that she doesn't want everything I say online to be documented and searchable for the rest of her life. 
and I might change my mind. And I think that this shows that people do use anonymous sites to avoid um, accountability, but, al but also because um, they have shared a controversial um, taboo, but not because, sorry, because they, not just because they've shared a taboo um, view, but out of privacy and security for themselves as well. And another lady from Kenya, aged 19 to 25, said that she uses the ability to be anonymous online to discuss issues of sex, early marriage, and other TV subjects. And I think that this shows that um, the use of an anonymity is um, an advantage to her because she's able to express herself when, discuss when discussing certain subjects. So, yeah. Uh, thanks, Mkia. Um, I'm aware Simon has something that he would like to, like yeah, to just add one, in here. Yeah, to add to this. I, one of the things we see with young people on Facebook is they use our privacy settings and, and change privacy for different things they do on Facebook, far more than older uh, users. And actually, it's very much about audience. So the point that the person from the Netherlands uh, in your survey was saying, I think was it Netherlands or Sweden, um, Actually, the point is, if you use those settings on Facebook, you, everything you say is not publicly searchable by everyone. So things you've only shared with a small number of people can only be seen by, with, by those people. So I think that's what we see, particularly young people understand that, and therefore they can be themselves, but be themselves with different groups of people for different kinds of issues. Thanks, Simon. Um, that's a, it's a good comment to make there. Um, Alina, I'm, I'm just going to come to you for a last bit of this section of the discussion. We, we have 10 minutes left at the end uh, for, for comments, but um, personal reflections or experiences about the challenges anonymity poses? Um, well, yeah, it's interesting we're talking about accountability as a good thing, but then that really depends on which country you're talking about. For example, I did, wrote a dissertation about human rights in Guatemala, so about people talking about the, the war and the genocide that occurred, and I really tried to contact them, the human rights activists, but that was not possible because they were anonymous. So in a sense, that way, anonymity is, anonymity is used to a good way, but on the other hand, because the government doesn't allow them to be who they really are in the real world, which you just, just said doesn't exist. They are limited in expressing their views because I wasn't able to contact them that easily. So in that sense, the role of government is so important in this sense. Did you get your essay on the end? Yeah, I did. <laughs> good, good. Um, good to hear. Um, so I think, no, the question I had to move into the discussion was do the benefits outweigh the challenges. I think we've heard throughout the discussion this is an emphatic no because you can't really, it, they, you can't, one can't outweigh the other. Both are important. Um, so th there is a balance and this has been reiterated um, time and time again. So comments from the floor now, uh, which we seem to have lots of. Okay, um, Marianne, can we, can we finish Marianne's story? Does anyone mind if we do that first? Because I'm, I'm quite interested. Oh, you want to Okay, part three. Um, I'll give you the, yeah, okay, part three. I feel like Essip. Okay, so Nadia has now come out. She's no longer invisible, and so in a sense she's no longer anonymous because there is a link between anonymity and visibility and invisibility. So um, Huffington Post has um, published articles and things are going very well. But remember, homelessness, particularly in definitional terms, is a pathway in and out of various sorts of homelessness. By this time, she and her mum had found accommodation. She was in and out of homelessness twice. As she became more stable in her life and her mother was more stable because this had a very traumatic effect on both of them, they found somewhere safe to live, um, she started to think about being once homeless girl, her persona. And then she was becoming less and less um, in, in, in enthusiastic about all the unwanted attention she was getting. And this is my point with this part three. Her own community started to get a hold of her once they knew who she was with her last name now is now being used, which I will not give, um, and she's getting some very unpleasant uh, responses from her, her community, very upsetting. So coming out, to owning being homeless, showing that you can, you can, you can become non-homeless, you can get out of the situation by using your full name and being out there and her real person, once homeless girl now Nadia with her last name decided this was enough and she has just recently decided to um, discontinue her Twitter feed discontinue her blog and um, return to anonymity in the sense that she asked the Huffington Post to take down her articles. 
because she wanted to retreat from this unwanted visibility. And that took some time. I had to offer her legal advice via friends. Fortunately, she managed to persuade Huffington Post to take down her article. This is another story again. They did, which was good. She is now discontented. She's now blogging under another name, herself. And in terms of my publication of her story, we conferred. And she said, could I please, because I was working with her visibility option, could I take away her surname? She's still very concerned about being pursued about her community by a community who do not like hearing that a member of their community has been homeless. She is no longer homeless. She's um, done her GS, she's done her A-levels. She's going to go to university and she's going to make a thing of it. So she has experienced the double-sided, uh, the double-edged sword that we are talking about today. But I'll leave others comment because the moral of the story will pop in at this time. My sense of the moral of the story. I hope that was clear. Nadia is very, very brave young woman. Thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, that was a really intriguing story, and, and thank you for sharing it. I think it's given us all something to talk about. So to move on into the discussion then, uh, comments from the floor? Okay, uh, so uh, at the back and then over here. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Andy. I represent and belongs to Erotics Indonesia, and hopefully I can present my other Indonesian colleagues here. So I do agree uh, with this. Uh, this debate is not being, uh, it's not whether being anonymous or not is good or, uh, bad, or, or bad, but I think that the best thing that we have to concern of the impacts of this, the disinterpretation or the challenge of being anonymous or not. So, here we're discussing that using the internet as a part of our life, we have to, I agree that we have to educate the people who use that. So when they be anonymous, they still uh, were using human rights as a basis, as a platform, or as a perspective. So we know that we're not going to violence uh, other uh, uh, rights, for example, like that. Because in our case, that for example, uh, the women who are living with IHV and AIDS, and also the LGBT groups, as we know that this is the marginalized group here in Indonesia, we found that being anonymous or not is not the issues here, but then whether we still use, uh, we don't use our name or being uh, anonymous, we still what is it, get uh, violence and blockage by, uh, I don't know, who's going to blockage our website for something like that. And the second one is like, because here we know that there are representing of the industry uh, uh, side, we do believe that the info uh, involvement of the multi-stakeholder, including uh, industrial uh, aspect, is very important here because we know that we are using the social media made by Facebook, Twitter, and so on and so forth, and then we don't not really understand whether they use the human rights as their platform to what is it to protect our rights as a human. And the second one is very important when we know the social level views here uh, you say that 86% said that it was important to people who were able to anonymous online if they want. But I wanna want to know more that is it is it any further what is this data that it will say that uh, it's not only about anonymous but it's um, more than uh, what is the uh, what is what is the solution if then we get uh, for example, receive anonymous abuse online and then may be necessary if uh, it will be anonymous. So I want to know whether there is a solution or data after you do this uh, result. Yes, okay. Thank well, you very much. There wasn't anything in our survey specifically about solutions to the problem, but I'm sure um, everyone here will have their own idea about solutions to the problem anonymity, anonymity poses. Um, and I think... Uh, you know, in order to safeguard anonymity is a right. Um, so, remote moderator? Uh, well, well, we'll take the comment in the back and then the remote moderator, with, uh, remote participant would like okay. to make something. So, uh, please continue. Hi, my name is Anthony Bouch. Uh, I'm a consultant working for Internews in Bangkok, Thailand, and I work in the area of uh, cybersecurity and information security. Uh, on the topic of behavior and accountability, I think it does depend on context, and I don't believe it automatically removes social norms or that it's an, uh, necessarily an attempt to evade accountability. And I'd like to suggest to the panelists that perhaps identity is in fact defined by um, a set of shared values and behaviors, whether using a real name or a pseudonym, um, and that within a given online community, it's the protections 
offered by or afforded to that community that set the stage for participation and behavior, uh, whether for individuals having fun or seeking medical advice or for journalists attempting to defend human rights. Um, so I'd also, if you don't mind, Jack, I'd like to suggest that perhaps your confidence in using your real name and taking responsibility for your behaviors online stem in part from those protections and the protections that you benefit from in the part of the world that, that you currently live in. And so um, protections, shared values, and identity, I think, are an interesting topic and, and perhaps as if not more relevant than whether anonymity is actually a good or bad or the pros and cons of anonymity uh, in isolation. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, does anyone, we've got one from the remote participant. Uh, it just to know, is there any other comments from the floor? Uh, uh, Louise, I'll come to you. Hi there. Um, so we've got one comment from Charlie Sakida, who's based in the Philippines and who's part of the Peace and Conflict Journalism Network. Um, and he's asking that there are a lot of issues out there that need to be reported in the media, but the media's challenge on anonymity is that we don't have a named source in the case, which is important because it provides accountability and credibility. Also, when the media reports on anonymous sources, the danger can be transferred from the anonymous source to the journalist who reported it. Any thoughts, perhaps from the um, uh, from Donny B or any of the other panelists? Uh, does anyone have comments they want to make on that one? Um, so, any of the industry panelists or Marian, do you have anything you want to say there? Do you want to uh, maybe repeat it just again, Hannah, and, and briefly, um, Donny? I think this question was ad addressed to you, but uh, just. A brief, yeah, or if anyone in the audience wants to comment um, how the media can find it difficult to source anonymous um, kind of quotes they're getting or references about stories, so how do they um, kind of show the credibility when anonymous users are rep reporting something to them? Well, I think Alina definitely uh, struggled with that one when writing your essay. Just yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I don't. What, what do we actually mean by the media? Are we talking about the old-fashioned media, the TV, who wants to have a real person online? Or do we talk about media in a more modern sense? Because then anonymous bloggers, I think that's not a problem at all there. It's a really popular tool and becoming more and more important. So I don't, I don't see the problem. Maybe it is still a problem for old-fashioned media, but, well, they have a lot of problems. So, sorry. Um. Thanks very much, uh, Marianne and Ronnie. I see comments from both of you, sir. I think Reporters Without Borders are a source here for inspiration and ideas. Our media freedom in the UK, at least, certainly in the wake of something called the Leveson Inquiry, is that the right to keep your sources anonymous is part of journalistic ethics in old-fashioned media, and the right to and the right to protect journalists in the new-fashioned media, namely online bloggers, is becoming more and more um, recognised. So we're really at the cutting edge of thinking about these things. But Reporters Without Borders and some of the work being done for social uh, citizen um, citizen um, journalists, is, I think, is a very important point of intersection. But these things are not self-explanatory. But anonymous sources do not necessarily discredit. The reporting has to be done with following journalistic ethics in new and old-fashioned forms. Uh, Donnie, would you like to... Um, sorry. And, and Nigel, uh, is there a comment you'd like to make? Yeah, there, to? There's some, uh, some cases in Indonesia that uh, several mainstream media, they quote uh, the source anonymously. Even they quote from the uh, anonymous uh, anonymous uh, uh, source. So quote the, the quoting the, the 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 source person anonymously is different with quoting the anonymous uh, the source. But there are several cases when the uh, uh, mainstream media they quote from the anonymous uh, the source uh, person. So it it not about Again, it's not about the anonymous or pseudonym or anonymity. It's about the credibility of the source. When information uh, 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 relies on the internet and it uh, has the credibility, it, how to count, how to counting the credit, how how to understand this source anonymous is credible or not is is depends so many ways. For example, from the content itself, also from, for example, if you're using Twitter, is from the followers or from the response from of the followers. So yes, you can answer. definitely see that. Um, so I hope the remote participant got their uh, 
response that they were looking for. Just, uh, just, I see. Could I, I mean, just, 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 just very briefly on this. I mean, this, this is just, in, I mean, incredibly important. But again, it's, it's, an, it's an issue of confidence. And whether it's old media or, or, or new media, I mean, the journalistic experience is, is absolutely critical that sources can remain anonymous. And that there has to be confidence in, com, confidence in the legislative framework of, a, of a, where the journalist or where the publication is based, that that should happen. Thank you very much, Nigel. Um, I think a final comment from the floor, then. I see uh, someone a few years back would like, would like to make a point. Well, well actually, uh, my name is Miss Wan, and I come from uh, Small Wars in Cambodia. I don't know whether how many of you here know Cambodia. <laughs> All right. Um, regarding to the technology in Cambodia, it's just um, quite new to Cambodian people and uh, the people who can access to the internet just in the capital city and uh, the town who can access the internet and uh, currently uh, most of the young generation they uh, uh, actively participate in uh, disseminate information and sharing information about the political and uh, they even don't know about how to uh, protect themselves from sharing those in kind of information. So, um, my question is just like, I want to ask you the, is your project that provides some, you know, uh, some kind of training courses to, you know, target, uh, uh, communities or citizen journalists and, uh, or the ways of, uh, people we can say that the citizen journalists because they will share the information than the something else. And then so, if your organization or other organization here provide you know, some uh, training courses about uh, online safety or uh, at least uh, online video that they can, uh, the community people can learn from that. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. So yeah, um, the organization that we're part of, Southern International, I'm sure they would be glad to talk to you, especially in regards to online safety. Um, it, it's what they do. So, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm sure you'll get uh, lots of response at the end. So, um, so. I think that's everything. Um, I'm aware there are some people that haven't come to that I did intend to, but um, I think it, uh, yeah, okay. We'll conclude because, oh, we're five minutes over. I'm sorry, everyone. You probably want to go to lunch. Um, so, conclusion, um, I'm really bad at this bit. Sorry. Uh, but sort of what we saw really here was the, uh, the survey results that we've been mentioning through a, a sort of, a, as far as the benefits and the challenges are concerned, we definitely saw benefit on, um, a peer-to-peer -peer level, the anonymity uh, protects people. Uh, it protects people from uh, the societal norms that we're talking about. Um, and it was mentioned earlier on that that, that might just be sort of uh, codes of uh, conduct within sort of um, a specific place. I'm not entirely sure uh, about the theory that you're working on there. Um, I didn't pick it up completely, but I'd be really interested to talk to you about that at the end, as I'm sure other people would do too. Um, uh, maybe a wider context to set this discussion in. Um, and on a peer-to-peer -peer level, we can definitely see that there are benefits uh, to anonymity. Um, you know, we've mentioned uh, sort of the LGBT uh, community um, uh, act uh, being uh, being activists and um, and uh, human rights bloggers for whom anonymity protects them. It's a ne necessity. Uh, it, it really is a life or death situation. However, on the other hand, we also see uh, the challenges anonymity poses. That um, people do use it to evade accountability um, and. Uh, uh, for, for other reasons too. So what we really need to ask ourselves is how do we meet the challenges anonymity poses? So I think a part of that is it's, it's always education because when we see 86% of our respondents agreed that we have to have anonymity, that it's necessary, that we want it there, at least on some services, maybe not on others, um, it, it really does depend on the context and the platform. Um, but then we really do we need to educate people um, about its uses, uh, how to use it well. And, and I think that uh, that that is being done now. It should be be done more in the future. And and asking people about, about ways that they can solve the problems um, that they see uh, in their day to day lives and um, the anonymity causes, uh, so we can improve and uh, make sure that the benefits really shine through. So thank you very very much for uh, coming, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>
ICANN, and I'm the moderator for the workshop that you are in right now, which is uh, uh, workshop number 210, The Role of the Technical Community in Internet Governance. This topic came up as a result of, I'd say, an evolution or a maturation of the way in which the stakeholder groups, the various stakeholder groups that we talk about, uh, have uh, choose the people that we send to uh, uh, their outside organizations, extra stakeholder organizations, such as the UN uh, CSTD working group on uh, on um, enhanced cooperation, etc. Uh, the uh, issue came up that uh, the processes were not well defined at least in the technical community, uh, or well documented. And we thought that it would be a good idea uh, to work on that problem. And at, and at the same time, there was a sense of, uh, uh, well, how, do, do, how much do we know about how we really ought to be interacting uh, with other groups and with the substantive issues involved in, uh, in Internet governance? So this, this is the reason for the proposal of the workshop. And, uh, Although the initial description of it, which appears on the web and probably in other places, uh, gave a relatively narrow uh, dimension, uh, uh, sorry, a narrow scope of, this, of the subject matter of the workshop, uh, more recently we thought uh, it's more important to gather all of the issues where the technical community does interact and say, uh, well, what's appropriate? How should we interact? Where should the, uh, um, where should, uh, the limits of our uh, interaction be simply as a, as community representatives as opposed to individuals, and uh, on the other hand, uh, where should we be actively involved? Uh, and maybe we're not right now. So it's an examination of the interaction uh, that uh, uh, I think uh, will help us as we examine the issues to become more effective in the overall uh, multi-stakeholder um, uh, events uh, related to internet governance. So. We have a uh, panel of um, five people, plus myself, uh, all of whom have been asked to um, examine their thoughts, their ideas about uh, the technical community and its interaction. You're going to hear from every one of them. And after we uh, uh, go, go through, then we're going to turn to you. And we're going to ask you to uh, contribute your thoughts. Uh, we'll respond to the extent that responses are, uh, are appropriate. Uh, and I think we have the possibility of having a relatively um, spirited conversation, uh, given the fact that the, the attitudes I've heard range from the very narrow to the very broad, and uh, the issue of uh, how, where prof the bounds are for professional responsibility uh, are, uh, are, I think, very fairly fluid right now, at least in people's minds. So that's the program. We have um, a remote um, moderator, and if uh, questions and comments come in from the outside, we'll, I'll ask Avery Doria to uh, signal us and re uh, relay them to us. Uh, the, I'm going to introduce each of the panelists by name, and uh, then I'm going to ask them to describe their affiliation, but in the spirit of Twitter, they can do it in no more than 140 characters. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's start. Uh, Matthew Shears. 140 characters. How about CDT? <laughs> Center for Democracy and Technology. It's your turn now. Oh, thanks, George, for that clarification. Okay, so even though I'm affiliated with the uh, Center for Democracy and Technology, which is a civil society organization, I'm going to... Um, actually talk about my time in other stakeholder groupings and particularly my time in the technical community as ISOC's Director of Public Policy. Um, and give you a bit of a kind of a framework as to how I've seen the role of the technical community evolve over the past uh, seven, eight years and, and even longer. Um, I came into the internet governance space at the PrepCom for Tunis of the WSIS process. Uh, so back in 2005. And at that time, uh, ISOC was a much smaller organization. Um, public policy was decided by effectively myself and Lynn Santamore as we went through the PrepCon and into the Tunis policy uh, process. And um, we had a very clear, defined role um, in the negotiations and in the PrepCon. 
And that was very much to represent, you know, and I put that in, in quote marks, um, the interests, the policy interests of the technical community um, broadly, not specifically, but rather more broadly. Um, there was at that time some engagement by the regional internet registries and others in the WISIS process, but very much um, ISOC was responsible for communicating the principles by which the technical community approached internet governance and internet policy issues. Um, and there are others from other technical community organizations here who can correct me if I get any of this wrong. But the interesting thing in the process of going from the WISIS into the IGF um, the deliberations on enhanced cooperation, and then the evolution of the technical community's involvement in internet governance has been quite interesting. And we're seeing, if you will, the culmination of it in the recent Montevideo statement. Um, over time, we've seen a recognition that um, internet governance is more than just technical matters. It's about capacity building. It's about reaching out to other stakeholders. And that became pretty apparent pretty quickly coming out of the RISIS when it was clear that many governments and many stakeholders didn't really have a very good understanding of what the technical community did, and indeed about the internet more specifically as well. And so part of the process of, of engaging with those stakeholders was to build that capacity building component. And each and every one of the technical community institutions and organizations actually contributed to that process. And so that's, that's seen an evolution, if you will, over time into the recognition that, yes, we need to communicate more and educate more, and our role is definitely that, but at the same time, we really need to reach out more. And so the outreach started, outreach started to governments, and you saw that in the form of the government roundtables, the RRs had, and other initiatives. And these were very important initiatives that um, helped, if you will, expand not only the, the role of the technical community in terms of building out uh, its responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis other players, but also the importance of bringing that level of understanding to those other players and to bringing up their understanding of the internet as a whole. And if you will, um, there's been an, a growing, certainly in my personal sense, a growing realization that while the day-to-day -day management of the internet is absolutely within the purview of the technical community, there is a bigger responsibility that they have, and I believe that they are stepping up to that and taking strides in the right direction and contributing. And if anything, recent developments, that's kind of the code word for you know what, um, have pointed to the need to expedite that, that stepping up and reaching out to other stakeholders and, and looking at perhaps and we're you know, looking at how the, the, the framework and the landscape is going to evolve. So now I'm with civil society, so I come to this from a somewhat different perspective. And of course, our discussions over the past couple of days have been quite interesting with regards to uh, other developments, like the Brazil summit and things like that. But I think we'll, we'll get back to that a little later on. So uh, maybe we can talk about that then. Thank you, Matthew. Adia? Uh, thank you, George. Um, Adiel Apollon, CEO of, um, of Afrenic, um, Afrenic being one of the <coughs> member registry and in charge of uh, the Africa region. The role of the technical community in internet governance. I think to, to, to really understand this, we have to go back to the, to the very origin of the internet, if we, if we want to, to take it that way. And, uh, <coughs> Uh, I like the fact that the internet movement starts uh, profoundly with the technical community, those who make the internet work. Um, and uh, it was a tool for communication, um, very technical protocol that allow, you know, um, um, uh, computer to, to communicate among themselves. So the technical community has played a very central role while still embracing the multi-stakeholder approach. But well, this was kind of a very informal way of uh, addressing internet governance until the research process, where because of this process being run under the umbrella of um, UN-like uh, environment, the demarcation of the different stock stakeholders was needed at some, at some point of time. Uh, 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 but all that has evolved, and 
after the recess, we continue uh, working, reinforcing the multi-stakeholder approach. But every time we talk about the, the Dominican governments, the technical community is the first community that is highlighted because uh, it supports that they come into the system with a little bit more knowledge or background of the technicality of the internet. But today, this is not uh, really uh, what we have to aim at anymore because the internet has evolved a lot, has moved away from uh, a technology that was uh, pretty much um, um, in the hand of only the technical community and all know themselves. I was uh, in, in a panel this morning when I was mentioning that uh, um, 20 years ago, at the very beginning of the internet, you can fight spam by just picking your phone and calling the sysadmin of the other network and telling him that he is running an open relay and you solve the issue. Uh, today that is not possible anymore uh, because the network has grown, the interest has become very, very uh, uh, diverse. So while the technical communities continue playing a very significant role to make sure that the network works, it is stable and it continues to, to work based on the, the principle um, of, of the protocol, other actors, other stakeholders uh, have joined. Uh, the, the, the overall internet, internet goal. And, and it requests from us as technical community an adjustment, but it requests other as well to adjust so that we find the, the middle one. The middle so the role of the technical community be, remain kind of central, but not the only key role in this uh, uh, internet governance uh, uh, environment. That's what I will say for now, and uh, I think we will we'll extend more on this. Yeah, your comments about the internet uh, technical community. Uh, lead me to think about the size of it, and if you were in, to include everybody in the everybody who dealt with the internet in terms of uh, of management, uh, building it, software developers, uh, uh, so on, you probably are in the uh, below millions of people. Uh, probably about 99 percent of those people simply want the internet to work, and they couldn't care less about internet governance as long as it makes it work, as long as the internet works for them. Uh, Christine, well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Christina Rida and work for the telecom regulator in Egypt. And um, like Matthew, I'll probably talk about my uh, previous life. <laughs> and uh, um, I, I've worked very closely at the beginning of my career with the uh, technical community because I've contributed to um, uh, getting uh, Egypt connected to the internet. So um, and it was like a general saying uh, phone calls to certain people that could get our um, uh, IP addresses uh, and uh, through the routes uh, from Europe to the US. So it was easy at the time just to phone calls. Today it's a bit more difficult. Um, talking about uh, the role of the technical community, I mainly want to bring a perspective which is a bit different coming from a region uh, which has maybe uh, less participation in the technical community. And that's specifically uh, the uh, developing grants, the Arab region, possibly also uh, Africa, if I may say. Um, I, I think the, inter the technical community has done a marvelous job in building the internet. Um, now the, the dynamics are uh, changing because so many people are relying on the internet, are using the internet, and they, uh, like others said, they don't care about anything else except that the internet works for them every day. And when something doesn't happen right, they just look for the closest person they can talk to. They don't want to go to sophisticated stakeholders that the internet governance might be stakeholder or whatever. <laughs> so um, I think the technical community should now um, work to build the internet economy like they work to build the, the internet itself. And, and that requires them to continue to do their the roles, which they normally do. It's their ongoing work. Um, in the operation, also their proactive work and reactive in, uh, you know, um, mitigating risks, um, uh, introducing new technologies. Uh, but they should maybe focus uh, more. Technically, should focus more on capacity building, and that's a key issue, because, like, uh, like you were saying, George, there are so many people that are technical experts, but maybe cannot really be part of the technical community, 
And this is because they need some capacity building of how to contribute. And this is part of reaching out to stakeholders, to other stakeholders, because if you reach out to those technical experts in those parts of the world, you can through them reach to the users, through them reach to the policy makers and to civil societies in those areas. So I'll stop at that and maybe continue with the discussion afterwards. Thank you, Christine. Audrey? Good afternoon. My name is Audrey Plank. I'm at Intel Corporation in the Global Policy Division. Um, so just a few uh, thoughts about the role of the business. I was asked to speak about the business from a business perspective. And um, as I thought about that and as I continue to think about these sort of somewhat superficial delineations that we have between stakeholder groups, um, one of the main points I wanted to to bring up is that the business community, at least from the ICT sector perspective, I would argue, is very much also the technical community. And um, if you think about the, I mean, if I went inside Intel and asked the 65,000 engineers that work for us who they identify with, they would certainly not say the business community. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so from that perspective, I think that it's important that, uh, you know, we have these separations for the facility of having dialogue and having multi-stakeholderism, but from a business community spec uh, perspective, I would argue, or at least from our perspective at Intel, we're very much, as much if not more of the technical community in many ways than, any, than anywhere else. Um, my own personal background is, is rather different. Um, I've spent most of my time in government at the OECD. I spent some time. I've been at Intel for five years. Um, so I don't myself, I cannot myself claim uh, a role in the technical community more in the policy community, but we don't define policy as a community. So um, I'm the business community for now. Um, so I think, you know, if you asked, years ago to what my colleague Matthew said and what Adil said, there was a sense um, that the technical community was doing technical things and the engineers were building things. And beyond that, there wasn't really a lot of interest in the technical community or the business community in sort of the broader issues that I think we now think of as internet governance and we're here to talk about at the IGF. Uh, but I think that's changed a lot. It's changed a lot in the last few years. I've watched it change internally at Intel. I've watched it change within my peer companies in the sector uh, where there's this increasing awareness that um, the hardware and software, the interoperable infrastructure that's being built on a regular basis inside our companies across standards bodies, uh, that the implications of that work goes beyond just one proprietary company or one standardization effort and that there are much broader policy and geopolitical implications to things that happen um, as we build the technology than maybe perhaps there was five or ten years ago. And I think that's a positive development. There's more, at least, um, I witnessed more engineers engaged in, in my work. Um, I've been coming to IGF since the very beginning. Uh, and, and not just IGS, but other governance-related organizations from standardization bodies to uh, ISOC to other, other places. So, um, so we've got the positive trend, and so there's a recognition that the role of the technical and business community in this case is broader than just building and operating, which is extremely important, um, but it's also in setting policy. So just a few things that I think um, are primary interests of the business community. The first is innovation. Probably goes without saying, but without innovation, it's really not a very interesting place for, for business to be uh, building things. Uh, standardization, because that's what makes things interoperate and, and work well together. Uh, technology proliferation of building capacity across borders and places where connectivity is still lacking. Uh, and then I think we've moved into the realm of public policy and capacity building, as, as my colleagues already said, as the sort of five or six areas that from the, that the business community, in terms of our role, business technical community, and, and our angle of learning that governments, I would say those are where we are focused. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bill Drake from the University of Zurich, where I teach internet governance, and I'm also the chair of the non-commercial users constituency in ICANN. Um, and George and I were talking about this panel a half a year ago or more, 
And at the time we said, oh, well, this is a ripe and juicy topic that should be controversial. Um, and I'm not feeling the controversy. So I'm going to try and spice it up a little bit by being controversial. Um, somebody has to do it. Let's take it as a given that the technical community has done wonderful work, built the internet, uh, constructed these things, maintains, ministers the net, and we all benefit, and that's all great. So uh, kudos to everybody. Um, now let's move on from there. Um, I would say that the technical community is sort of ontologically challenged. Um, uh, there's a real question as to who it is, um, what, it, what it really stands for, and how it interacts with other players. And I think that this is becoming more pressing over time. Um, you know, we, we used to think of the technical community as uh, those people who had the engineering and computer science skills to actually build stuff and operate stuff, whatever. Then it sort of expanded the concept into, you know, as the internet sort of became institutionalized, it became the people who run the institutions that operate the internet. Then as those institutions grew to take on board other players who weren't necessarily engineers and computer scientists, but were lawyers or civil society people or business people, whatever, then they could have become that. And pretty soon the term had sort of gotten very expansively used. Um, you have, I'm just curious, how many people in this room consider themselves to be in the technical community? Can you keep your hands up? Okay, gentlemen in the back, uh, are you an engineer? You. Are you an engineer? Okay, thank you. Woman in the back, are you an engineer? Okay, good. He's an engineer, I know. You're an engineer, I know. What about the gentleman back there? Okay, so we got all engineers over here. How about on this side? Well, it could be a scientist. Okay. You're Sam, you're a journalist. But you're a technical community? Okay. Woman in the back? Engineer? This is a very weird group. Okay, yes? Engineers. Okay, so, yeah, so these are all pure cases. And I already knew an engineer, too. And yet, if you go, if you had just been in the meeting that I was in about an hour ago, where uh, we were all gathered together with Fadi Shahadi and the rest, um, talking about how the technical community was going to respond to the Brazilian summit and everything like that, you look around the room, and there were civil society people, and there were business people, and there were government people, and they all think that they're the technical community. Um, and if you are a member of ISOC, as I have been since, what, 1995, and they claim 50,000 members or something, how many of them do you think are engineers? If you go to an ICANN meeting, uh, you participate in the ICANN process, does that make you a member of the technical community? ICANN's full of domainers, it's full of intellectual property lawyers, it's full of ISP uh, operators, uh, well, okay, they, they count. Um, it's still government people. So are they all the technical community too? And I'll go on and on and on. And the point is, the term has gotten a little bit elastic. Um, so then, who's really the technical community? Um, when we were meeting uh, the other day on Sunday, Lynn St. Amour, the head of the ISOC, said, you know, I've come to really hate this term, the technical community. I feel like it boxes us in. And I thought, but you guys always use the term technical community to box other people out. I mean, the, the technical community moniker has been used as a source of power to say, we're the folks who know how to do this stuff. We're the responsible folks that manage the Internet. You're a bunch of guys trying to cause trouble with your claims for this, that, and the other. And so leave it to us, the trusted circle of folks who know how to make this work. So it just I thought that was kind of funny that Lynn was expressing this frustration with a term that they've leveraged to great advantage. Um, and have worn on their sleeve very proudly for a very long time. But because the term has, has become more elastically used, um, what you end up with is inner circles. Uh, a lot of what goes on in, in the um, ICANN world and in the IGF world and other is very tribal. We talk about silos all the time, but it's, more, it's beyond silos, it's tribal. Um, there are networks of people who trust each other, 
and who believe that each other can be relied on to play, to say the right things, to hold the right positions, to advance the right causes. And then there are other people who are really not so sure how they are, where they're coming from, whatever. And you kind of maybe pull back a bit from them. And we've got that all over this environment. And between the technical community and, for example, civil society, we have, in consequence, very strained relations, which is very strange because there are a lot of people in civil society who consider themselves to be in the technical community. Um, and there are people in the technical community who consider themselves to be civil society. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm, I guess, civil society. I'm an academic, but I'm also a constituency chair in ICANN. Does that make me a technical community? I don't know. Um, I'm an ASAC member, but, but I'm not part of the inner circle of trusted people that should be uh, allowed to make decisions of any import. So, um, so the point is, it's a quite interesting social formation. Uh, as a political scientist who was raised to think, uh, look at the political configurations and say, well, there's the state, there's civil society, and there's the private sector. The technical community is this weird transversal kind of thing. And nobody kind of knows where it fits. The UN couldn't figure out where it fits when we did WISIS. They kept saying everything had to be organized into the traditional three, and we had to say, wait, no, 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 technical. And then it became the technical and the academic community, which is a completely confusing term, because then it turned out to mean actually only some academics, those academics who align themselves with the technical community. Um, so not academics. So Milton Mueller wasn't the, wasn't the technical community person, uh, or an academic, apparently. Um, but so it all gets very, it all gets very odd. And um, I think that to bring this to a, something of a close, um, the fact that we just had this meeting um, everybody's in a buzz now at this conference about what's actually going on outside the, the sessions, right? I mean, the, the sessions are all nice, the workshops are nice, the main sessions are nice, but what's everybody talking about? Everybody's talking about the Brazil meeting and how is that going to work, uh, Brazil and ICANN, et cetera, et cetera. And they're running around having meeting after meeting, powwowing with different configurations and retelling the story. And we just had several somewhat contested meetings with the civil society people, first trying to figure out whether they wanted to talk to the technical community and whether they trusted the technical community and whether the technical community was trying to take over the Brazilian meeting, was going to force everybody out and lock us out of the process, and or you know how could we engage them? Did we have to build our own space in competition with them? And then finally we got a, a joint meeting with Fadi where we tried to do a little bridge building and he said, you know, kumbaya, let's all come together. But this goes on and on and on. Um, the, the technical community's amorphous boundaries and political allegiances and connections to other uh, stakeholder groupings and perceptions among governments. I, all through the WISIS, I had developing country governments saying to me, who are these people? You know, um, it remains, I think, politically a contestable point and something that merits uh, some real conversation. So. It's, it's fine to slap the technical community on the back for all its contributions in making the internet work, but we need to go beyond that and try and think about how do we build out the technical community in a democratic, transparent way and build better relationships between it and the other players in the internet governance. Thank you, Bill. There's a lot to work on there. Um, there's a lot to work on there. Um, let me, uh, I, I can't help but uh, respond to some of the things you said because I agree with most of what you said, but uh, there are some additional thoughts. Uh, there is a difference between the technical community or any community where the boundaries are often uh, uh, very loose, they're, there's, uh, they're porous, people uh, go back and forth between being in the community or out in terms of their, their interests and what they're doing, and stakeholder groups. Uh, the internet technical community, as I mentioned earlier, I think has several million people in it. Uh, and uh, maybe 1% of them are involved in internet governance, and maybe 1% of the 1% are involved to the point where they, they come to meetings like this, they, uh, uh, they, they participate, they, they, they vote with their time and their money uh, to, uh, to be parts of, the, of, of what you've called the core, and I think that's rightly so. The, there's two problems, I think. One is that once you take a community with porous and fuzzy boundaries 
and redefine multiple communities into stakeholder groups, then you are drawing, explicitly drawing some lines between those communities. And the way in which you draw those lines and where you are in the uh, one or more of the communities uh, reflects directly into the influence you have, the representation you have, and the power that you have. And so you're no longer a community, you're a block in, the, in a political sense. Uh, the second thing is that uh, uh, the mapping of people into either stakeholder groups or even communities uh, is, uh, is not clear cut. Uh, you've mentioned uh, 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 your various affiliations. I know that I've worked for governments. I've uh, run a consulting firm. Uh, so I'm in business, I'm in government, uh, I've run an NGO, an, an active NGO project, so I'm civil society, um, and I'm technical. Now, uh, maybe my, my legs are in the technical community and my body is in the uh, civil society community, my arms are somewhere else. I can't be defined in, in, in neat terms. I'm, uh, uh, I'm a combination and I can relate more or less in various ways to all of those communities. And uh, so as such, um, I think it's worth noting that if, you cons if you're concerned about the, the, the contribution of the technical community, it may be a different contribution than the contribution of the technical stakeholder group, and it may be a different contribution uh, than one could get by, by talking with individual members of the technical community. So there's a, there's a fuzziness there, and maybe you're right, maybe the concept of community has been it's been so stretched that the elastic no longer uh, is effective and we shouldn't use those words. If so, what's the replacement model uh, or is this a concept that isn't worth talking about that in fact is no longer controversial? <laughs> <laughs> that's a four letter word. <laughs> so, okay, well that's sort of a long uh, uh, dump of thoughts. So now, okay, we come to um, the second um, uh, part of the discussion. And first I'd like to ask uh, if there are any members of the panel who feel uh, sufficiently spirited to uh, challenge or agree with or comment on, extend the comments of any other member of the panel. I'm always happy to not necessarily challenge. In this, this case I certainly agree with, with both Bill and George. Um, also having worked in government, worked for business, now in the civil society and having been with the technical community, Honestly, I think we're done with these stakeholder categorizations. I think we've had them for 10 years. They came in through the WSIS. We need to think a little bit beyond them. I mean, to borrow for some great work that Avery's doing, I think we need to think in a whole different context around this and talk about issue stakeholders. We have an issue that we're concerned about. But we're not technical community, we're not civil society, we're something else. And quite frankly, that's the way we need to go because I, I came from the technical community into civil society. But within civil society, I'm still seen as kind of half in and half out. You know, I haven't earned my civil society credentials yet, which is problematical because I'm not invited to the business stakeholder meetings, even though I guess I'm by way of business. And when I'm in my civil society stakeholder meetings, you know, sometimes I'm you know, looked at a little scum. So anyway, that's my comment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I like this very much, Matthew, actually, but I think to get there, I mean, we've gone a long way, but to get there, actually, we have to really have a level of trust. And I think that's very important because uh, the, the minute we can actually trust each other, we can we can go around one specific issue and have this discussion irrespective of what are the different uh, views, and I just wanted to add that. So we're, we're aiming for a, a condition which might be called post-stakeholderism or post-multi-stakeholder modeling. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, next. Anybody else? Anybody else on the panel? All right, all right. You, the audience, are now have... Yeah, uh, I mean, just reacting to what you just said, um, are we are we uh, combining uh, the the multi-stakeholder principle with the notion of community? Because if we are talking about post-multi-stakeholderism, uh, does it mean that by redefining the, the community or the boundary, we are removing the um, uh, participation from different stake who are, or people who have different stake in the discussion? So that is uh, another extension of this, this discussion. Thank you. Uh, I, I sense. 
don't think, I think that Matthew said post-stakeholderism and not post-multi-stakeholderism. Because, you know, after everything we've been through the last three days, I really think we should not walk out of this panel and start saying things like post-multi-stakeholderism. This is not, but I know you didn't. I'm clarifying, I'm, I'm covering for you, Matthew, that you did not say post-multi-stakeholderism. Uh, just, just to be clear. As a post-structural, post-Marxist, I quite like post multi stakeholder <laughs> academics slow to terms of this. Can we just go, do, how about holder? We'll just be holders. <laughs> okay. uh, audience question, and I, I'm going to, I, I, I see two hands, but I also see such a pained look on Avery's face that it looks like somebody is driving a stake through her. And, and I'm wondering if, uh, uh, so I give you the, you, you, uh, uh, all right, who, who would like to be the mic carrier here? Okay, we have two. We have one for the panel and we have one for the audience. And it's right here. Uh, so Avri and then gentleman there and then gentleman there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Avri Doria speaking. And you mentioned, um, Matt was nice enough to mention work that I was doing. Um, and basically the notion was that and, and I think of stakeholders, and thank you for talking about putting a stake through me, but I think of stakes as something that we indeed do pick up. And basically what I've been talking about is, is a fluid notion of being a, a stakeholder and that it is the stakeholder groups that become more flexible within a, a more developed notion of multi-stakeholderism. So as we start to think about multi-stakeholder groups, what we're talking about is not three groups that were predetermined by a set of governments without even consulting the rest of the stakeholders, but rather that we are all stakeholders, we are participating in multi-stakeholderism, but the groupings are something that, that is flexible, that is fluid, that we are in one, we are in several, we are more dedicated to one at one point in time, in one issue, and we're perhaps more dedicated to another at another point of time on another issue. Thanks. Thank you. Um, let's go to the far, to my left, uh, the far back of the room. With the microphone. Kathy? Oh, we have one. Oh, we have one. Good. Split the room up. Terrific. This is multi-stakeholder. Uh, we don't hear anything. No, you. We both had working ones. We both had mine. <laughs> Hi, my name is Peter Lord. Yeah, please, uh, yeah, identify yourself for, uh, and your organization if you wish. Yes. Um, again, that's Peter Lord with Oracle. And uh, I think we've had an interesting conversation around identity over the last you know, period of time here. Um, and I think that's just an outgrowth of increasing diversity in size of the community, whatever labeled it is. And that's, a, that's a healthy thing, frankly, in my mind. Uh, the question, I think, though, for me, is what are the tools that technologists need to engage with the other aspects of their life right now, which is policy? When we talk about internet governance, frequently often talk about educating policymakers on technology. But what about the reverse? What are the tools that if the panelists could so talk about perhaps gaps for technologists in engaging in the governance discussions. Be helpful. Thank you for the question. Uh, Who would like to respond on the panel? Tools for technologists involved in uh, policy making. Well, I mean, uh, if you're asking for tools, that construction right there is already a very engineering one, but I'm not sure. I, I don't have a specific tool or methodology. Um, I will say that there's a continuing need for an engagement dialogue. I used to, in previous life, be president of a NGO called Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility, which was um, created by computer scientists who opposed Star Wars in the 19, early 1980s. And uh, we had a one point when I, I think when I left to being president, I think we had like 1,700 paid members in 25 countries or something like that. And they were mostly um, computer scientists, technical people who were very political. 
and who had come to understand that they have a very deep stake in policy and social justice and questions of privacy and everything else. Um, and I think they got that by engaging in dialogue and thinking and with uh, the wider world. I guess, so I guess if you had the the liberal tool is go outside. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Breathe some fresh air, get away from the computer screen, talk to some other people. Um, that, that's normally pretty helpful. Um, but in terms of um, a specific methodology or set of tools that one can implement to that end, I, I don't know that I could identify any handy toolkit. Um, read some, read, there's plenty of great stuff. If, you're, if internet governance is a starting point, though, there's certainly plenty of internet governance stuff that should be appealing to a person with technical skills, but which also speaks to larger political social issues, and maybe by plowing through some of that material and participating in those groups, then the links would become clearer and the interest would grow and so on. I just had two ideas to Peter's question. One, I mean, one is sort of not that great, which is that companies should continue to prioritize engagement in these issues. And that's always, for companies, it's always a little hard to align what is this internet governance thing with what is my business model. And so as a result, you tend to get uh, people like me when you might rather have somebody else. Um, so there's that whole set of issues, which is how to make the internet governance issues relevant to, to the business side of the business sector. And that's, I, I think, from a business community perspective, an ongoing challenge. Um, the other thing I think is capacity building, which has you know, become this wonderfully cliche thing that we should all go do. And uh, we are doing it to some, some great degree. But I, I think that, that if, if in, in terms of capacity building globally, that's a really obvious way to engage the technical community and some of the, or the technical people within your groups, your organizations. Um, in terms of getting them exposed to the larger issues beyond sort of the issues, the, the opportunities that um, that they mentioned. Let me just um, one of the one of the big challenges, and it, this isn't particular to the technical community. It's about language and priorities, and overcoming the restrictions that are pose on each stakeholder group, to use that word. Um, is something that can only be broken down when you say, okay, we've got a particular challenge or issue we need to resolve. We can't resolve it with one particular group. So a technical community cannot resolve it on their own, nor can governments. So then you have to, we need to move to a process where we're addressing challenges, bringing the stakeholders around the table and saying, this is how we do it. And everybody brings their respective expertise, and people learn the language of each other. And that's the way that we start to cross some of those, those thresholds. Um, maybe maybe one, one uh, issue could be for the technical community to focus more on uh, how the internet is used and not how the internet works. Because I'll give you an example. Uh, um, I've worked a bit with, uh, with the Arab community on internationalized domain names on the Arabic language. And one easy solution to that, from the perspective of the technical community, would have been just to use the language script of Arabic and put it in there and have it done. But doing that was actually totally irrelevant to the people using the internet because there were so many other considerations about the language variants and the way they, they use the language and everything that had nothing to do with just simply putting uh, that in there. So, so I think that's one, one issue to actually see what we focus on what, how the people use the internet and how the internet uh, should be used, not how early it works. What you just said just reinforces what uh, I want to say. So it, it, it goes down to breaking the barrier between uh, um, um, the, the, the standard, the technical aspect, and the usage aspect. So to answer the question about about the tool, uh, the, 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 the toolkit, I think one critical one is to embrace diversity and, and embrace, uh, uh, be ready 
to uh, understand, as Mathieu said, that people may think things differently, may express things differently, as, and, and have different uh, experience and perspective on the same issue. And we have to accept that first. Different stakeholders must agree that people may have different approach and different perspective on the same issue and agree to put all those expertise together to address the issue. Or, or until, until we work hard individually as group but stakeholders to, to, to break those barriers and recognize the diversity that is entrenched in the internet today, uh, we, we will not uh, move forward in, in, in this debate. And this is, I'm talking to us as technical community. Thank you. So you've received an answer from every member of the panel. Uh, terrific, except me and I won't bother. Uh, so next uh, person over here, Kathy, no, take the back. Well, Simon Abraham from the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore, India. Uh, taking the idea of different approaches and different perspectives forward, I wanted to know what are the three ways in which, or the three most important ways in which, the technical community and the business community disagree with each other when it comes to human rights. That's a multi-sectoral question. <laughs> uh, let's see, who would, <laughs> the way in which the, uh, the technical and the business community differ with respect to their, their stands on human rights. Okay, there is a challenge. Who would like to respond to that? We all want to think about that a little bit? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you, could you elaborate just a bit? You, you stumped us for the moment, but give us some more material to work with. Uh, in India, we have constituted a MAG uh, to hold the Internet Governance uh, Forum in India. We have a very strange MAG which has additional stakeholders. The media is considered a stakeholder and youth is considered a stakeholder. I went to the last MAG meeting and some NGOs at the meeting said, since India has so many farmers, we should have farmers as a stakeholder. Since India has so many fishermen, then we should also have fishermen as stakeholders. So my test to determine whether a stakeholder is useful at the table is that the stakeholder disagrees with an existing stakeholder. If the stakeholders speak in a common voice, if they dance to the same beat, then perhaps the stakeholder is redundant on the discussion table. Thank you on that particular subject. They may agree with uh, on certain subjects and disagree on others. But now, does that give anybody, any member of the panel courage to jump into this? <laughs> okay. Not to the issue of specific human rights issues, but to the point of disagreement. Disagreement in multi-stakeholder processes is important, but I wouldn't necessarily foreclose from a process any particular group if they have a stake in that discussion, no matter what that discussion is, then uh, it should be open to that stakeholder. Just a comment. Yeah, I agree with Matthew. And I guess I would say that while I don't know how to respond with regard to any specific issue between the technical and, and business community, I would say that I, they're still pretty split. I mean, if you look at the Montevideo statement, there was no business input to that statement. So we're definitely not, we were not included in that discussion or in that outcome. So it's not something that, so there's clearly a, a difference there. I don't know whether it's fair enough to call it a disagreement, but they're certainly not the same still. Next. David, is your hand raised? Yes. Thank you. Kathy, back, way back, corner. Um, it is certainly true that uh, I don't know if I uh, David K. Electronic Australia. Uh, it's certainly, and I can, Gina, so it's um, certainly true that um, whoever sort of defines who the stakeholders are, it, when there's a formal set of who the stakeholders are, whoever defines who those stakeholders are and where they fit has some sort of is exerting some sort of power over the process, consciously or not. Um, and we do need to, I think we do need to be continually reviewing and um, 
refining any anywhere where we formally define stakeholders in making them fit into groups and things. We really need to be careful that we aren't locking people out. And I do actually think we have had a example within ICANN where we really um, messed this up, right? The, we, there was an attempt to form a consumer constituency within the GNSO and I, it, I think a lot of the reason why it failed because it didn't neatly fit in the silos we'd already defined and certainly not in the one where our, it didn't, you know, culturally fit in the one where its bylaws said it probably should be and so it just didn't happen and we ended up losing some people that could have been engaged in the process and I think that's a, a, a lesson for us about formalising stakeholders and how it can be a real problem. So let me uh, respond with a question uh, and to you and, and that is uh, how sympathetic are you given that comment and also to Mr. Abraham is it uh, who raised the last point uh, of uh, Aubrey's model of uh, issue uh, groups as opposed to stakeholder groups. I'm, I'm quite sympathetic to the issue group rather than state rather than a formal con stakeholder constituency sort of model. Sort of. <laughs> you, you, you need other balances when you ignore. You know, there are other problems that can ignore from uh, just abandoning the idea of balance between formal stakeholders as well. So. Does anybody on the panel want to comment on that exchange? Okay. Then. Yes. yes. Well, I think you think you know the the two uh, or three past intervention um, are sitting clearly at the debate about the multi stakeholders itself, the definition of that. Are we that way um, <coughs> closing ourselves to the, into the definition of the UN organization which has government, civil society and business only? Or are we are talking about people who have different view or different interest in, in, in an issue, which, which is something else. But I think the debate here today is about the technical community role in the uh, internet governance. Um, so uh, if, we, if we agree that the technical community doesn't have a very firm boundary and it it's can, it's can embrace uh, a different group of people who have interest in the technical running of the internet, then we move from there to <coughs> what can we do or those who recognize themselves as part of the technical community do in the, in the overall context of the internet governance. Um, <coughs> one of them could be we, we capacity building, how to help other people to understand the way that multi stakeholder open and bottom up process in policy definition, for instance, can work because we have practiced that for the past 20 years. How can we take that and uh, move that to other people who are getting interested or who are interested in um, joining the process uh, lately? I think that is one challenge that we have, uh, 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 which we will talk about. I think, uh, I think to, to, achieve that, to achieve that, um, uh, technical community needs to, uh, how do they say, uh, walk the talk. So if we're preaching multi-stakeholder participation, then we actually need to, uh, like we're discussing, uh, accept challenging that, accept introducing change if needed, and uh, if, if needed, but, but if we do really believe, then why, why few challenges? So open up, uh, reach out to other stakeholders, and um, let the parties take over that we've been preaching. Thank you. Uh, next uh, comment question. Yeah, um, my name is Evelyn Strickland from Internet New Zealand and it bridges quite nicely with that last comment in that Internet New Zealand is a .nz CCTLD um, but that we've devolved that into a subsidiary and are actually a non-profit that's for the benefit of um, the New Zealand internet community. And um, related to that, I organized the national IGF, um, which is called NetHui. And I just sort of wanted to share, you know, the idea of stakeholders. One of the things that they ask for reports from initiatives is to give a list of how many people from each stakeholder group came. And we can't do that because people who attend bring all their hats on issues and in groups their day job themselves as a user, you know, as a parent, as a, as a, as a sister, you know, these sort of things. So I think, um, I think there's, yeah, a recognition that it is very hard to make these distinctions. Anybody on the panel want to comment? I think there may be general agreement with that. We're all individually multi-stakeholders. 
in some one or another set of proportions. Uh, next comment. I, I see no hands. Oh, I see a hand. Okay, Here we, okay Suzanne. <laughs> This is only for a lot of the folks in here. Um, okay. <laughs> All over the place. Um, here from ICANN. Um, I serve as a, a rep well, in several roles. One of them is as a liaison to the ICANN Board of Directors from the Road Server Advisory Committee, which is as classic a technical community role as ICANN has. Um, but, you know, I show up with slightly different experience because I'm, I'm part of a technical community subset working technologist, but I have extensive experience in the policy-like roles and activities within ICANN, the RIRs, et cetera. I think I want to pick up on something that I believe Matthew said that we turned it to, we sort of snippeted a little bit about post-multi-stakeholderism, but I think you made an important point about getting past the labels and thinking about how do we get work done. And when someone like me shows up, there, there, there's a real, I think it would, would work better for everybody if we stop thinking in terms of what labels fit and what it means or doesn't mean about, what the labels mean about what we can do or what our perspectives are. Because for instance, I have seen the extensive assumption that being a, a working technologist means that I'm siloed into a, a high priesthood. It also has been taken to mean that I'm siloed into complete ignorance of policy matters and legal and business matters and should be separated, but in a different way. I think that's silly. So what I'm going to suggest people think about instead is when anybody shows up, even technologists, the, think about how to answer the question, how do you help? Where can this person make a contribution? How do we get something moving? And if there's a you know, comment anybody on the panel wants to make about how I help other people that may come from a similar background to mine to show up in a place, you know, the IGF or ICANN or any of those circles, as a technologist who wants to work with others and understands that we have to work together, how do we get past this? Comments? I think it's worth looking at stereotypes of people from the technical community, uh, which you've touched on, Suzanne. And on the one hand, you have, uh, well, those of you in the technical community will recognize this, the, uh, the, the programmer who does nothing except program, and you lock him in a room and uh, periodically push raw meat under the door, and he periodically pushes code out, uh, and uh, that's the way in which they work. Uh, and on the other end, there's, uh, there are people who are in, are in the technical community but are really very broadly experienced in, in, in other fields. And uh, the problem comes, at least in my experience, of the people who think they are broadly uh, familiar in other fields and uh, uh, their opinions outside the technical community should, should be taken as seriously as their technical opinions that they don't deserve to be. And I think what this does is it, it leads to a diminution of trust in technical uh, uh, advice that is given by members of the community. Um, anybody else want to comment on this before we talk, uh, call on Michael? Very quickly, I don't think this is a problem for the technical community alone. I think we may actually be a bit fair on the technical community. Every single one of these communities suffers from the same challenges, so um, let's just keep that in the back of our minds. I was basically going to say the same thing and also note that um, there are organizations that have developed over the years in order to broadly coordinate these stakeholder groups. And it seems that they have become more and more removed from the expertise that they're supposedly representing and more and more um, focused on being representative to you know, the policy environment or the governmental environment. So, you know, I, don't, I, I guess the question over if, if you actually took this path in the future would be what happens to all these organizations that we've built up over time in order to be representative of the stakeholder groups that if you start looking at issues rather than stakeholders might be less relevant. Okay, first Michael and then the lady in the back row there. Michael Burstein. And then... Um, I 
guess I, I, the, the question that I ask is what, um, what limits uh, the technical community sees on the application of the their approach to the multi-stakeholder model um, and multi-stakeholder decision making. Uh, um, uh, the background to that is that um, I think through internet, internet governance issues, uh, the model is being pushed into wider and wider areas of public policy. Um, I think it's, it's moving into wider areas of public policy in other spheres as well, but I think uh, uh, certainly in the area that this area is being moved into wider and wider areas of public policy. And I wonder if, uh, if you folks think there's any limits to where it's applicable, and, uh, and if so, why? So the issue is the limits of uh, applicability of, uh, of, uh, of advice from the technical community in various settings. No, 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 that's not. No, that's not? Oh, I sorry. I'm, could you clarify? No, no that, that, that's not the question. Uh, the question is the limits of the applicability of the multi-stakeholder model. Um, uh, I want I want that I want that question because uh, we've heard it repeatedly over the last few days of the significance of the multi stakeholder model. Certain types of things are difficult. So I suppose there are fields where at least the arguments of the people who control the process would be that bringing everybody to the table impedes the effectiveness of the decision making. I'm not saying I necessarily buy that all the time, but that would certainly be the argument that would be made. And there are organizations that are intergovernmental that aren't multi-stakeholder by definition and charter, and so there's limits to, and within those organizations to the extent that they deal with ICT issues, and many of them do. I think um, I think Michael you raised a very interesting question, but I I actually look at it a bit differently. I actually look at the reason why we talk about it so much because we really don't know what it is, and we really haven't figured out what the practical limits of its application is yet or are yet. So in that sense, I think that we we um, we just need to give it more time. We in the multi-stakeholder uh, principles focus session. And we had a robust discussion about some of the principles, but you know, we had comments and questions about each one of them. And I think we're still in a very early stage in terms of figuring out the application of this particular model. So, um, yeah, there may be practical limits, as Bill says, but um, we've got some ways to go yet, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, a lady in the back row is next, followed by Manal. Okay. Um, my name is Asha Wolf. Um, this is my first IGF. Um, I'm a non-technical person who founded something called Crypto Party, which aimed to teach people around the world how to use basic cryptography tools. Um, when I came to IGF to register, I explained to them I'm a content curator, and they said, what's that? Um, and I said, oh, well, sometimes I also write articles for The Guardian. And they said, oh, you're a journalist. I said, but it's freelance. They said, oh, you're a freelance journalist. They wrote freelance journalist down on my card. And then they said, oh, but we won't, we'll, we'll put you down as civil society. And so, of course, I can't get access to the media centre. So in all of this sort of setting of agendas, what you lose is a crossover of, of how journalism and civil society and technology are engaging together and um, and there's real sort of, of, of limitations placed on people and organisations and, um, and and the sort of things that I would have hoped to have um, accessed here. Um, my question is, is basically how do we move to work around limitations when I guess they don't even understand where things are going to begin with. Thank you. Does anybody wish to comment on that? It may stand well alone. Um, anybody? No. Okay. Uh, Manal? Okay, thank you. Uh, just a very quick uh, 
remark on the notion of multi-stakeholderism. Um, actually, I was not involved in coming up with the term, but I believe the merits behind uh, multi-stakeholderism is that we do not exclude anyone who feels he has a stake. So uh, I feel it's more of not excluding anyone than defining exactly who are uh, the stakeholders. I mean, anyone who feels that he is a stakeholder, then he is. It's, it's probably, uh, I cannot tell anyone you're not a stakeholder. So, so is, it, is it more of um, seeing... Uh, I understand this, this won't solve a problem when you're creating, uh, for example, uh, groups of limited numbers, then we have to have uh, one representation of all stakeholders. But uh, then um, I, I, th this brings us to what Avery said earlier, and this might be flexible and issue-based. Then, Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm going to take a stab at that one in the, in the previous comments as well. Um, and somebody correct me if I get this wrong. But one of the limita in particular to your question, one of the limitations that we're working with in, in this particular context here at the IGF is um, because it's part of a it's a UN effectively a UN meeting in a manner of speaking, um, and also because of the stakeholder definitions that were established in the Tunis agenda. So um, how we get around those so that you can have access to the media center, I think that's probably something that you'll have to take up with the organizers. Um, there's no really solution to that, I'm afraid, within this, within this framework. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. In that case, let's see. It's uh, Adiel would like to uh, raise a topic. Uh, I'm sorry, but I keep coming back to the role of technical community in the global internet governance. And uh, <coughs> I think we, we will not be able to clearly define uh, with an uh, exact role who is part of the technical community or not, because it's obvious that the technical community today can embrace any, anyone, and most the stakeholders in can be anyone who has a stake on it, but we can say that people who have interest in the running and the stability of the internet can be considered as part of those who have technical stake in the whole discussion. So what can those who are labeled with, with, with that do to advance the internet governance ecosystem globally? Should they stick onto their main principal responsibility or stake, which is to keep the internet running, so to or, or only focus on making the router run the packet and making them work, or they have to go beyond that and, and try to maybe uh, uh, engage more into capacity building. Um, can, can, can they uh, engage more into um, um, a dialogue? in advancing the overall global internet governance. I think those are, for me, critical uh, issues that could, um, um, I would like to hear from uh, the others. So for me, particularly from an athletic perspective, it's something that we are trying to work on since the beginning. As area, our main responsibility is to manage number of resources, but we have also embraced numerous um, area uh, which are not really directly linked to that, and and sometimes it's very challenging to explain or to get um, uh, the community understand that that we have to embrace those things. So um, I'm, I'm I'm very keen to hear from from others. So we're engaged in some role reversal here. Uh, Adiel has uh, asked a question, and uh, would anybody in the audience like to respond directly to this? Uh, I see uh, somebody in a red dress, I think, uh, in the back row. Uh, it's just the point of this question. Oh, oh, oh. I Sorry. Uh, Martin, then, did you want to respond to Adiel? Anybody want to respond to Adiel? Okay, you raised the point there, maybe. Does the is that fair, Adil? Yeah. Does the technical community's role extend beyond technical stuff? 
Okay? Uh, <laughs> now you're ready. Well, well, of course it does. I'm the Royal Clark. Um, uh, I'm president of the Internet Society in Australia and an engineer of some many years. Of course it does. We, we're citizens too. So therefore, we do have just as much right to offer views in the policy debate. That's the whole crux of being a democratic system or a participatory system. And so therefore, we should. Now, actually, I'd like to go to a topic, if I may neatly segue on, <laughs> to an area where perhaps we, we have all not been able to work well enough together. And that is in the area of surveillance, lawful intercept and metadata. So we are in a situation today where there is no technical standard that defines metadata. So we have the rampant requests from the various agencies asking for metadata and yet those of us in the room who are good technologists know that the only way I can give you metadata is to turn logging on on my, on my servers, on my routers and generate vast quantities of data with all sorts of fun and games available for all and sundry. So we've, we've perhaps not worked sufficiently well with the, with the non-technical community to come up with appropriate principles and practices uh, to make this work effectively. Comments from the panel? Anybody else ever served on the Raven Working Group of IETF a few years back? That was a sh uh, excrement fight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. right I, there's somebody in the, who's been lost in the queue here, and I'll come back to that, and then I'll come to you, Martin. But Kathy, do you want to respond to that? I'm more about a deal. Uh, okay. Let's take your comment on that deal, then go to the person I've lost, and then to Martin. Uh, Kathy Hanley, Aaron. Um, I am painted with the broad brush of technical community because I work for a regional internet registry. However, I am a bona fide do uh, policy wonk, okay? I, you don't want to come to me about really tough questions about how to allocate or how anything runs. Um, they've taught me enough to not get lost. You've talked about policy and what the role is, but I ask you, what kind of policy? Are you talking about the policies that are in, you know, the, the internet? The, the IR community, um, policies here for CCTLDs, GNSO. Um, if we're going to get into the quagmire, we might as well go with our feet. Maybe we'll also respond to uh, Jen and to talk about this. I think there's a level of maturity for a specific technical uh, community to be able to engage in policies. Obviously, uh, the engagement in policies is, cannot be avoided. I mean, that's specifically what is needed in a multi-stakeholder environment. But I'm thinking about, let me say, technical experts. I don't want to say technical community, but technical experts back in my, from the place where I come from, they rarely engage in policies. And we've had this experience maybe with Africa, they rarely engage in policies of allocation. Although they are heavy users, they may be one of the biggest users in the continent, but they are rarely engaged. And I think this is this the type of capacity building that is needed to those technical communities that are outside of the normal uh, you know, internet governance technical community members. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, <clears throat> to the two aspects. The first aspect is extending the capacity building on policy to those who are not directly linked to what we do, which is number of resources. For instance, a developer who develops application online must know much about how number of resources are located uh, to understand the impact of those policy on what he, he does, uh, which is something that doesn't come it's obvious at the beginning because, you know, you know so, so that, that means the, the capacity building has to go beyond the immediate community. And if we extend that then to, to, to all our policy aspects, <coughs> maybe what to look at is are we engaging ourselves in policy 
that is generic or even if it is it is support or in policy that has some link back to what we do and as area we are seeing more and more that what we do is rampant to every corner of the internet everyone connect to the internet today and tomorrow will be using ip address somewhere so so inevitably our responsibility is 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 scope is, is growing in a way or another. It's probably for us to see how we define clearly that link and stay consistent in the way we, we, we work on the link toward all the other cross-border policy issues. Yeah. It's a big responsibility. Um, I'm embarrassed now to uh, tell you that I forgot whose hand was raised. Uh, I think it was somewhere here. It wasn't you, Martin. It was before you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for remembering me. Uh, I have a very simple and straightforward question. Uh, so, my name is Hong Ki Chan from South Korea, and I work for an Interpol Research Institute called Etri. Um, I'd like to know how technical standardization activities can resolve this long internet governance discussion. Thank you. A simple question. Who would like to answer it? <laughs> no. I'm not sure they can. That would be my answer. <laughs> uh, over here. <laughs> um, I, think, I think I can add to that question, George. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Go ahead, Michael. Well, first, it's, it's very clear that I've used to ask the question that uh, we lost the answer to. And of course, how could you lean back and look to the politicians and say it's their fault if it doesn't work? if you didn't contribute, or at least try to contribute. I think that that fact is clear. It's next to caring about your own business, make sure your interests are heard. It's also step up to the plate and contribute. And I think this is what's been done, and I really want to hammer that home. Uh, uh, from a non-technical perspective, I'm not an engineer. I dare say that in this room. Mm -hmm. So, the second thing, uh, what the welfare has uh, brought up is, 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 I think, an excellent example of that is the whole surveillance question, all the policy debate about it. How could you do it without understanding the technology? How could you do it without understanding how transparent or tricative we can make things, uh, how things stick together? Uh, so, actually, what you can do from a policy perspective, very dependent on the technology available. Yes. I was in the queue. Go ahead. No, no. Yeah. Just, just making sure George didn't forget me. Um, just to comment on the standards piece, I don't know whether standards alone can provide a resolution. Probably not because the political and policy dimensions. But um, I would say that the standardization community and the standards bodies have a really important role to play. And, and as we move through time and various controversies, and governments continue to try to develop public policy around governance, but also other issues like security and privacy. Um, we are always at risk of dividing the standards community in such a way that it becomes ineffective from a global governance perspective. And that seems, at least from a business perspective, and I assume to some degree from a technical community perspective, that's a huge risk and one that is, presents one of the most fundamental concerns about why we engage at the policy and political level because it has ends up having direct implications in the standardization process. And from a technologist's perspective, the standardization process is absolutely fundamental to building and operating the infrastructure. So I think we all should be very cognizant and concerned about maintaining the neutrality, the openness, the multi-stakeholder or whatever of um, standardization bodies, the global nature of them, to try to discourage the bifurcation of national standards away from global standards, which I think has is, is become a huge trend over time, um, and to make sure that those processes that have been, you know, that have contributed to the development of the internet continue to contrib contribute to the future. And I think that's an area where there's a lot of danger right now, and it's not clear how that's going to, to come out over time, but it's, it's absolutely fundamental. Thank you. Suzanne? Sure. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, 
just to, uh, George is going to love me for this because I'm going to refer back to a discussion in an earlier workshop that he ran today on core internet values. And we actually had an interesting um, discussion there. And the whole point of the core internet, core internet values, it's a dynamic coalition. The whole point there is to identify as a technical matter, but also, but more than a technical matter, what features of the way the internet works are so important that if you compromise them, you can't keep building and informing and enhancing the internet for future users and to solve future problems and for future policies you want to overlay on it. And being able to contribute that perspective to a policy debate strikes me as something that not only can the technical people do, but only the technical people can do as one of the inputs to making good decisions and good policies. That's a very nice summary. Um, so we have um, uh, a couple of minutes, literally a couple of minutes left, and I'm going to ask the panel if uh, all of this discussion has awakened uh, comments that they would like to make in closing. I am speechless. What? What happened to Impossible. <laughs> uh, no, I, thanks for the discussion. I think it's very thought provoking to think about other ways to organize ourselves around topics of interest so that we can more easily and flexibly work as a community. I think the roles and responsibilities will be something that will be devilish for a long, long time, and that's not such a bad thing. I mean, we had a good discussion about multi-stakeholderism or whatever, that, and whatever that may mean, and um, that's a good thing too. And this will also hopefully be discussed for some time. Thank you. No, I thank you for this discussion. It's been quite interactive, and I think it's. Um, uh, sort of unintentionally bring the, um, all the pieces of the puzzle together, which is an interesting thing. So uh, thank you for getting this together, George. Thank you very much. I think it was a very uh, lively discussion. Um, even we can clearly see that we cannot address one topic and not not touch on the, the other. We, 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 we can see that clearly. I think it's a, it's a very good thing and the debate must continue, the discussion must continue to try on to improve this and make this more, 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 more useful for us. Thanks. I resonate to what both Adiel and Matthew have said. This is a continuing discussion. If we went down one level into much more detail, it would take a lot more time and it would be equally and if not more interesting and that's what we have to do as communities and people interested in internet governance. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, please join me in thanking the panel and you with a round of applause.